Circa on Steroids Part 2. So we're going to go back to the you know original uh, application and, and stay pretty close to Hero Circa this time. So this time it's about cars, another durable asset that drives and will be replaced once in a while. So it's it's an extension in several dimensions. So it's a uh, it's it's an extension in the sense that there's multiple choices. It's not only about replace and not replace. Um, it's also about when you replace or uh, to your car. It's a uh, it's a choice between several different types of cars and several different ages of cars. So we're gonna try to model. Uh, the used car market or uh, how consumers trade with each other in the secondary market for cars. Okay, so there's not going to be a one hero sucker. There's going to be uh, several agents uh, who all potentially can buy cars and also trade with each other. Okay, so it's a, it's a dynamic equilibrium extension um, of the engine replacement model Except that we're not looking at buses, but at cars, and except that uh, a bus is is not determined by or by by its mileage, but uh, the the quality of a car is determined by its age and its its type. So there could be different types of cars. Anyway, so so we'll talk about this under the heading of equilibrium trade in automobile markets. And it's based on a paper I'm writing with Ken Gillingham from Yale and um, Fedor Ishakov from, from ANU. And, uh, fee, and, and Anas Monk Nielsen here from our department and then John Rust from Georgetown. So, um, yeah, so let's get started with lecture 15 in dynamic programming theory, computation and empirical application. So I want to start with, you know, a picture. Okay, so this is this is a Volvo. It's a Swedish car. It's it's kind of a high end of 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 uh, lock, of, of, of Volvos. It's a XC90, uh, and and it's you know it's a couple of years old this picture, but it's it's supposed to be a picture of a new car. Okay. So uh, how much is a Volvo in Denmark? And I guess for 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 you know. Uh, the international audience, you know, you can parse and you know take a take a, a time to think about how much could it possibly be. Okay, for for the rest of us, let's just continue and look. It's one point three five million Danish kroner, which corresponds to more than two hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so so this car is a very expensive car. It's also like I mean I pick the the higher end of of this class of car so it's like you know uh, the version with full leather seat uh, you know this full le le leather seats all uh, and it it has uh, uh, you know all wheel drive and and uh, you know seven seats the whole nine yards so it's like you know it's 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 a upper end Volvo but still you know two hundred grand that's a lot of money for a car. And in, in America, that would be something like $62,000 if you look at the manufacturer-suggested uh, retail price. So why are cars so expensive in Denmark? Well, that's because we are taxing them. Okay, so it's not just because you know the, the our Swedish brothers they are heavily discriminating against or, uh, against the Danes. It's it's just because we are paying very high registration taxes on car or new car taxes. So the tax system is roughly so that you pay. Uh, there's some deductions in the bottom, and then at some above some kink, you will start paying 180 percent in 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 registration tax. So um, well, at least it used to be like that. Right now, it's actually reduced to 150 percent, but you know, still quite a lot. And if that was not enough, we are on the top of the uh, of the. Uh, of the sum of the price and the registration tax, we're paying 25% value added tax. So we also pay tax off the taxes in with respect to cars. And Volvo is not the only example. So here, here's the uh, price. Here's the price of a, of a Toyota Avensis, um, uh, you know, be after taxes. And you can see Denmark, we, we are like number one in Europe. Okay, so you got all the other countries and uh, in in Europe here, uh, or many other countries in Europe, and and we got uh, we can see you know Denmark pretty much sticks out. And why? That's because of the tax. So this part of the uh, of the bar that's that's the taxes. But but then we actually, if you look at the price before taxes, it's uh, it's actually cured by um, 
it, it's actually uh, the, you know the lowest one uh, uh, along I I in the entire Europe. So in in some sense, the incidence of the taxes is actually on the producer side. So we get actually pretty cheap cars. It's just that we have to you know also pay a lot of money to the government to 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 uh, to, to, to register the car. Okay. Anyway, so, you know, that kind of, um, we are not just doing that to, you know, annoy consumers. We're getting a lot of tax revenue and just, you know, I'm just, uh, you know, throwing out some quick numbers here from, from the national accounts. So this is uh, 30 to 50 billion Danish kroner. So it's a lot of money. And, you know, if you want it in dollars, divide by, you know, roughly five, you know, maybe six. Um, and then that's in in terms of G Danish GDP, it's two to three percent. So so the annual taxes on cars is a lot of money. So it's four to seven percent of total tax revenue. And it, you know in Denmark we we already pay a lot of tax. So so it's a significant part of the budget. It's a significant part of GDP. And for the guy who want to buy a car, it's also you know a significant part of the price. So most of this revenue originates uh, from taxation of ownership and registration taxes of cars, but we also tax fuel and ownership and the and the the yeah. So we also tax fuel, so the usage of the car. Um, but but so when you're taxing cars, you know when you're making taxation, it's a relevant question to ask if you're taxing in an optimal way, and and if you're not, how can you make reforms that? That that changes uh, taxes in a more optimal direction. So so here it's widely understood that that transport externalities, for instance, that associated with car with uh, the car usage is uh, is is rarely priced appropriately. So you got uh, um, you got several externalities associated with 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 car ownership or car usage and. It's it's uh, congestion and then it's basically pollution uh, and uh, yeah, CO2 emissions. So this might lead us to think that we have underpriced congestion and incorrect uh, um, um, taxation of gasoline. Okay, so uh, in Denmark we are actually you know taxing uh, gasoline. Uh, I would say roughly the price uh, on at the pump is probably uh, twice as high as as in America, but but still we are we are. Um, we we it, and we are uh, generating a lot of tax revenue from from that. That's due to the taxes. Okay, so we have these fuel taxes, and um and and they're you know roughly half half the uh, the ta taxes corresponds to half the the price of the pump you know approximately. Um. So um, what you see here in this graph is the tax uh, the different taxes uh on cars and um. And you got the registration tax, that's the blue one. And then you got uh, the fuel taxes, that's that's the red one. And then you got uh, the ownership taxes. So we also pay ownership taxes uh, just for, you know, owning the car, irrespectively of, uh, you know, if, if it's related to, you know, just the fact that it's you have it under your name with a license plate on, then you pay a fixed amount every year uh, that depends on what whatever car it is, okay? So, so these are the ownership taxes, and these are kind of like a usage tax, the the, the fuel tax, right? Um, you see here where the registration tax is really, you know, jumping up and down, and this is not because I didn't get the precise numbers. It's because it's following the business cycle. So we had like a we had had like a, a upturn here until 1986, where you know the Danish prime minister went out and said it's going unbelievably well. But then there was like a, a a big bust in the economy that lasted for for like almost a decade. Um, and and the first thing that that when the economy hits the a downturn with such a big uh, a macro shock, it's 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 a. Uh, uh, it's it's the durable goods that are going to be postponed. Okay, so people going to uh, propone uh, they're going to reduce their replacement timing so that they do not replace that often, and and some people is going to go out and not have cars. So so this is what you see here is re really reflected in the economies. Then the, there was another uh, another boom in the economy. People rush out and buy new cars, and then there is um, then there is the. Uh, the dot com uh, downturn here, and people uh, stop buying cars, and then you know it goes up again, and then you have the financial crisis, and we are kind of back in a you know in the sump. 
Um, so, so, so the registration taxes are really highly pro-cyclical. You can also see some of it, you know, in 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 the use of gasoline in in the driving, but most of it is really driven by. Um, the fact that people are uh, making changes in how often they replace their cars. Okay, so well, here's a research question. You know, the overall broad research question. When you you know look at the picture of the cars and the prices and and and, and that business cycle and and think about how you reduce uh, uh, you know C can potentially reduce CO two emissions and and the contributions from the transport sector. So we want to look at a potential po policy option that is about lower the registration taxes and uh, introducing hard use, uh, higher usage taxes or uh, su such as uh, road routes of charging or uh, increasing prices increased prices of gasoline um, so uh, because that's really where the potential externalities would you know you would seemingly would be uh, it's mostly related to um, to the use of the car, okay? So, uh, car doesn't pollute if it doesn't drive. <laughs> car doesn't uh, uh, make congestion on the road if it's in the garage. So, uh, if that's where the externalities is, eh, then that's potentially uh, uh, what should be priced, okay? So, that's where you would, you know, put put taxes on. Is that done correctly? Well, that's, that's a... Uh, that's that's a subject for research. So in other words, if, if you wanted to um, analyze this question, well, you need a model that can uh, uh, that can that can look at various different outcomes um, from from you know from changing this policy. Okay, so we want to think about the equilibrium dynamics of the uh, car ownership uh, type choice and use, right? Because um, if you s lower registration taxes and increase uh, fuel prices or fuel taxes or inc uh, start having a road usage charging, it's going to change the balance between fixed and variable cost of car ownership. So that's going to affect the new car sales and also the trade in the secondary markets. Because if you suddenly make prices of new cars uh, lower, then people's going to go out and rush out and buy uh, buy used cars. Uh, uh, sorry, new cars, right? But so because they're cheaper, okay, that they used to be. But then this is a durable good, so someone else is going to buy those used cars uh, uh, later, or those used cars when they become used cars later, and and so um, uh, the people who buy a new car they actually depend on being able to sell it on the secondary market so they can replace and get their new car over and over again. And not everybody will be able to have new cars. So the price for the used cars is going to fall when you change the price of a new car okay so this is this is why it's you know super central to actually model this, this secondary market when you make policies that changes the prices of new cars because it doesn't only change the new car prices also the new car prices then we're gonna also it's also affecting the fleet age and the scrappage so when prices fall then people scrap more often the the uh, fleet age is going to get younger on average so people on average hold, hold, hold uh, newer cars uh, and the value of the car stock is also going to be changed. And from the individual's point of view, uh, the guy who already has a car that is very expensive, you know, spend uh, more than a million kroner on the Volvo, if it's suddenly half the price, he's going to lose. Okay, so we can calculate all this uh, if we have this dynamic equilibrium model. Now, another component, this is about the car choice and replacement. Another component that's really central to answering the question is we need to have a model that has driving. Okay, so the model would need to be able to make predictions about driving, fuel demand, and, and therefore all the emissions, um, so that we can analyze the effect of taxing that part of uh, economic behavior. So, um, so, so if you want to see the effect of changing road use or charging and um, gasoline prices. Well, you ne you better have something in the model that that the consumers are where the consumers would react to those policy changes. Okay, so so there's several issues here. Also, redistribution of in welfare. It's going to be different across different regions uh, that has different um, uh, driving needs with different uh, uh, commute needs uh, depending on where they li live. Maybe there's no public transport. So there's many things going on when you make 
a, 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 a reform like this. So if we're talking about like halving the registration taxes, we're moving around like 30 to 50 billion Danish kroner, and that's going to be a lot of redistribution. So figuring out um, what's going on is really central before you make uh, reforms like this. And then we need to capture all this stuff simultaneously. It's all these different uh, uh, effects at place, uh, and it's just mind-blowing to think about it without a model. It's just not something where you can like do a, a regression discontinuity sign diff and diff and you know capture everything at the same time and because of this general equilibrium effects there is there's all these effects that that, that I mentioned mentioned at the same time and they play together in a very very complex way so this is why we this is really a show a showcase for where dynamic structural models is an extremely powerful tool for policy analysis beyond this and this is something we, we already talked a little bit about there's also, you also need to account for the macroeconomic shocks um, so because of the pro cyclicality of the uh, of the demand for cars uh, then that's transmitted through down through the distribution um, of the uh, the car fleet as we'll see okay so here's here's what I mean this is the registration of cars that you see over time and you see it follows pretty much the same patterns in the registration taxes which are proportional to the value of the car that, that the consumers are buying so this is just in numbers numbers of cars of course the value of the individual cars has changed on, on the, over the business cycle as well but but you know uh, it, it also it's also true in numbers okay here you got the GDP growth and and you see it's it's obviously this curve is low when GDP growth is low and then in the up terms and people go uh, rush out and buy cars okay now this new registration of of um, of private cars the the, the pro cyclicality of that well that's just a new new cars but cars is really a durable good so if someone buys a new car in say uh, uh, 1998 it's going to be one year older in that year after so that that wave is going to travel through the distribution so let's just take a look at that so here's here's the 1995 cohort of cars okay so what do we have you here on this graph we got the uh, we got the, the the number of cars here on on, on the vertical axis. Uh, measured in, in in thousands. So here we got like roughly uh, you know 110,000 cars that are brand new in uh, 1996. So you got you know you got time here and, and you know time is moving forward this way and you got the car age here and then you know cars are aging when you go this way here. Okay, so this is a brand new car brought bought in 1995. There was around 110,000 of them. Okay, so this is you know for Denmark. So. Yeah, like I said, cars is a durable good, and it's actually quite durable. You know, on average, a car has something like, you know, 15 years. So it's not going to be scrapped the next period. It's going to be there. And so the amount of cars in 1996, the year after, is just going to be the same. Uh, the amount of cars from that cohort. It's the difference is it's just one year older. So now in in in, in the year after we have one hundred and ten thousand uh, one year old cars, and you can continue that, and then it, you know they will just continue along the diagonal uh, until you know uh, here we, we we will have to stop the grab. What you can see here is really this this decline here. Well, that's a, because of scrappage. Essentially, you know we we follow we have the entire register of Danish cars. So you know the, the cars are in the sample as long as they're not scrap and not exported and there's not a lot of export of cars okay um and 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 so so what you, this is reflecting here is that the cars are getting older they're disappearing from the economy because of the scrapped because of the the price uh, is declining and so any rep and, and the number of uh, the cost of repair is increasing so so it's just less and less and less affordable uh, uh, um, you know uh, not affordable but but uh, but but also rational to to uh, uh, to do maintenance of an older car. It's just at some point it's such it's a clunger, and then you it's like you you want to float throw it on the street and 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 um, or sell it to the scrapyard. Okay, and you can see this even more clearly when you look at the 1986 cohort because these cars here they're already like ten years old. Um, so when you um, continue here with that cohort, you see like as it get older, there's going to be very few left of them. Okay, so these cars here, uh, well, these are 25 year old cars, and so some cars are actually still there in the in the fleet uh, after uh, you know tw almost 25 years. Uh, 
Um, so this is indeed a durable good. So when you make policy that affects the price of an, the new uh, uh, good, it, it's going to affect the entire history of uh, of cars uh, in, in many years after that. Okay, so the, that that will be we'll need to take that into account. And, and if you remember the um, uh, the pro cyclicality of the new cars, you can see you can uh, you you would know that that will be transmitted as waves into the car age distribution. Okay, so here. You really see this. This is the this is the uh, uh, age distribution of cars. It's not at all uniform by any means, right? It's reflecting the history of past uh, macro conditions and new car purchases for uh, several years back. Okay, and then you you move this forward and you like fill out the the the, the picture here. You can see you get these waves in the in the distribution, and then you got it down here in the back. You got the new cars. That's uh, that's uh, the um, uh, what you saw on the on the graph with the uh, new car sales is going up and down, and that's transmitted uh, throughout the throughout times in the as waves in the car age distribution over time. Okay, so so macroeconomic shocks has really in a uh, um, it, it really has a. Uh, uh, impact on the car age distribution and also therefore on the choices of renewal of cars and whether you would buy a used car because you cannot buy used cars that are not uh, if they're not previously bought as new so so uh, so that has an effect on that okay so here's the wa waves in the the car in the car purchases so these were the stock of cars this is the uh, so to say the transactions of cars of course it's going to be most transactions of new cars and you can see here the new car sales you know it's Moving up and down with the with the business cycle, you got here in the you know the, in the late nineties until the boom uh, until the uh, dot com burst, and then you got uh, uh, or you know the economy picking up again until uh, two thousand eight where it drops again. So this is this is just reflecting new car purchases, but then there's also waves in the used car pur purchases, and they are kind of reflecting. Um, they're kind of reflecting the distribution of of our car age uh, car ages over time. So if there's a lot of uh, cars to change hands, well, then there's also uh, uh, waves in the car age distribution. Okay, um, and and then macroeconomic uh, conditions themselves can also ha have an impact on 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 the amount of sales. You know, um, so well, all of this is pretty complicated, and it's a uh, to model because it's a uh, you know. It, it, uh, it's a, you know there's so many things going on uh, simultaneously. So here's here's another thing I want to talk about. It's kind of also like a motivation for one one of the things we want to put into to modeling car uh, the car market. So uh, the previous graph, well, that showed um, you know basically the amount of trade. Um, so so here you you see the the aggregate amount of trade of different car vintages over time. Uh, but didn't say anything about who is trading, right? And this is what we would we would like to have a model for, right? I mean, there is different types of consumers. They are trading with each other, okay? So they uh, rich consumers are buying um, uh, new expensive cars, and then they hold them for some time, and they hand them down the food chain to the poor consumers, okay? And this is exactly a picture of this. So you got over here, you got you know the rich man's Volvo, uh, and then you got the poor man's Volvo. And the rich man here, that's John Rust. Um, and then there is the poor guy over here, that's that's myself, Badly Shanning. Um, and, and, and what happened was that uh, I was looking for a car. I couldn't, you know, afford to use a lot of money. Uh, and I was, you know, I was visiting John uh, uh, and to work with him for, for a year. So... Um, and and then John he he really wanted like uh, you know the new new Volvo with you know full leather seats and you know massage seats and and you know a, a, a car play all the new amenities that you can put into a luxury car okay so he wanted you know, to have a new car as a replacement for the other one and I was looking for 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 a new car or a used car. So John was kind enough to sell me uh, this car over here for a real bargain. Okay, so I'm really like at the tail of this distribution because he the price was one dollar. So so th this was uh, well probably also French prices, but um, but but you see here the gains from trade. I had a huge value of this car here for a year. Um, and 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 um, and and John has been using it since it was new and so sold it to a consumer 
that um, um, uh, you know wouldn't want to go out and make an uh, investment like this. Okay, so you got gains from trade between rich and poor consumers, and you know th this in, in some way this is not the perfect example because usually people sell them before, and then this the car they're selling has a high value, and you can get a good price for it, so you can stay in the segment of your car that you prefer. So if you really like brand new Volvos all the time, then uh, you depend on the the poorer consumers who can buy that car from you okay so so that's why uh, modeling trade also kind of um, naturally ask who are trading and we should have heterogeneity between the consumers we're gonna work with that too okay so you also see that in the data you got the holdings uh, of cars here in Denmark um, we divided them into two types of cars so there's heavy vehicles over here and light vehicles um, and then we have plotted that, that, that age distribution here. You got the car age here, the brand new cars here, and 25 year old cars here. Um, uh, it's not a mass point, it's just because every, this is 25 years and, and older, these cars. Um, and then here on this axis, you got the, um, you got the quintiles or the income quintiles. So, so you got the rich people from the, for the top income quintile here, and then you got the poor guys down here. Okay. So, uh, what you can immediately see, if you look at the heavy vehicles, well, it's really the, the rich guys that are buying the new ones. Okay. Now, now we can still see some of that business cycle pattern here. Um, that's that's inherited in this this graph, but generally the the masses in this end of the distribution, if you compare to the to the rest of the consumers, okay. And then the, as as you move down the 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 income quantiles this way, well, then you see more and more mass uh, relatively to uh, in the part of the distribution where where cars are replaced, okay. So so the the poorer consumers are buying the used cars, and the uh, richer consumers are buying the 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 newer cars. And if you look at the type choice between heavy and light vehicles where you got the rich consumers mostly buying the heavy uh, luxury, you know, big luxury cars and then the uh, essentially the, the middle income people are buying the new uh, small cars and then they're selling them uh, down the food chain uh, to, to some the people that are getting, um, that are further down in, uh, in the income distribution. Okay, so, you know, uh, I could continue to talk forever and display the data in, in all sorts of different ways. Um, uh, so these are some of the key facts that I wanted to show you. So, so let's move on here and talk about how would you model this to be able to answer the question about the effect of a reform that changes the balance between registration taxes and usage taxes. So the goal here is, well, that's really the goal, right? We want to be able to analyze such a reform and then be able to make inference about the effects on a whole range of variables like, you know, what is the tax revenue? Uh, you know, uh, are we going to make a big hole in the government budget by making this reform? Or um, are we going to have more revenue? Or how do you do this? Okay. What is the effect on, um, on ownership uh, uh, and, and replacement time, fuel, fuel economy, CO2 emission, and, and road use? Okay. This is what we want to do. Okay. So, in, in order to answer that question, well, we need, we, we need the model and we need to design the model to be able to to capture, to be able to say something about that, while at the same time be consistent with the data. So we've already looked a little bit at the data. Um, so, so the model should be able to, you know, track all these mechanisms, uh, scrappage, replacement time, and the choice versus uh, the, the substitution between new versus used cars. Uh, otherwise, it's hard to, to say anything about the, the prices or the price curve. Right? And then a type choice, different types of cars that are more or less fuel efficient. Or, um, and, 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 and that in turn affect the, the driving. So if you have uh, you know, big gas consumers relative to small cars and, and, um, and, uh, and you make expectations about how much you drive, well, that they affect those two, those two uh, variables or those two choices are very interconnected that the, uh, the amount of, when you make the amount of, you choose your car, you think about how much you're going to drive it because if you're driving a lot, you may want to have a very fuel efficient car uh, if your marginal utility of money is high. Okay, then we want to have trading, sorting of cars like, you know, John into the new luxury car, me into the old crappy car uh, between different types of consumers. Uh, by the way, it's not an old crappy car. It's a Volvo V70 um, XC for cross country. It's a beautiful car. It's just a little bit old, 
And it was like, you know, wonderful to drive. Thank you, John. Okay, so let's move on. So we want equilibrium price mechanism in the used car market. Um, so it turns out these, if you change the price of registration tax, it's going to have effect on the prices of used cars. Uh, and and then, you know, the business cycle variation, we saw that was really, really important uh, in new car uh, pur purchases and, and, and therefore also has an effect on the used car market um, because uh, the whole uh, fleet of cars, the distribution, age distribution of cars is mimicked by, uh, uh, by previous new car sales. So we see these waves in the distribution. And then also something we didn't talk much about, but the life cycle patterns of driving and, uh, and new or used car purchases is uh, evidently important because income is changing a lot of the time. Driving demand is changing a lot of the time, as we saw in the last talk, um, which was about residential and work location choices. Um, you saw that the, as, as throughout the life cycle, then, then families are moving outside of the city and, and, and facing much larger commute. As their family size increase, they get married and children and so on, can't afford to live close to the city, to the workplace. So, uh, so here, life, these life cycle patterns are evidently are potentially important. Um, so these are a list of things we would potentially like to include into our model. And then we would like to structurally estimate this model in the Danish data, uh, register data to do uh, counterfactuals. And we have really lots of heterogeneity here in rich dynamics. Uh, I mean, we observe, every, basically we observe everything we want to analyze uh, 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 the question with a model uh, outlined up here. Uh, we have uh, the amount, uh, we, we observe the entire universe of Danish cars and uh, detailed characteristics about uh, about the cars, the background characteristics like, you know, the number of axles, the weight, the fuel efficiency, um, uh, and, and, uh, and a bunch of other characteristics about the car, the brand, uh, and, and also actually the price of the new car. And then we also observe, then we can take these, these, these data here on, on cars and link them to the owners. So we observe who's owning each of the cars so we know their income, education, where they live and work, and how many children they have, you know, the whole nine yards. So we know everything about the the owners of the car, and then we, since we can link the owners to the cars, and we have the entire universe of cars, we therefore also observe who is trading with who. Okay, so every time a, a car is changing owner, well, it's going to be registered in our data set. So and, and beyond that, we also observe how much people are using their cars because. Um, the use of the car is actually uh, recorded every other year. So we have these biannual inspections of cars in Denmark, and then their authorities would write down what the odometer reading is. So we can use these registers combined to essentially have data on uh, both individuals' cars and how much they are driving. Okay. Um, so so uh, and that's that's the kind of the potential source of data that we have. Then we, after having estimated this model on this very rich data set, we want to. You know, simulate counterfactual, uh, simulate the counterfactual equilibrium from this model um, by changing, say, the tax policy by late. Let's say, what, see what happens if we register uh, half the registration tax and make a, um, a, a revenue neutral reform where we increase the uh, um, uh, gasoline prices. How much should the gasoline price uh, tax be then? Okay. So we can do things like that and we're going to do that with, with, with our model. Okay. So, so this this is kind of you know what we learned from the data. This is what we this is this is a goal. Okay. Oh man. So to those of you who've seen Mike Keen's talk, one of the things he is you know saying pretty strongly is start simple. Okay. You can't do everything, uh, and and you want and, and you, you can't do everything, and you you have to do you have to start simple so you understand what's going on, okay, and then gradually build on, but 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 uh, don't start modeling the whole thing at once, okay. So I'm gonna read a quote that's kind of uh, uh, you know a quote from Mike Keen's talk, which was this small start approach may seem obvious, but my experience is that most people try to program up their full blown model right from the start. This is a big mistake, both from a programming point of view and with respect to developing economic intuition. And this is exactly what happened to us. We took all the bullets here and we coded up, uh, put it into our model, coded up in C, and tried to see if we can estimate the model. And um, so um, that was not a good idea. And, and there was many things. So we learned the hard way. There's many things 
uh, that we didn't really understand because all these mechanisms they were you know uh, uh, they were playing against each other at the same time. So so many different incentives in play, and just understanding each of them first is really necessary. So you would think that this advice should apply to you, you know uh, um, it only applies to beginners, but uh, you know. Um, we really learned the hard way that it applies to everyone. Okay, so I mean, we have experts on the team, including the like the founding father of uh, uh, dynamic structural models, and and you know, real hardcore experts in 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 coding like Fedor Ishakov. Okay, so 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 uh, but but so so I'm saying really, I really mean it. Start simple. Mike Keen is right. Okay, so this is what we did. Then try to do do. So we ended up uh, uh, doing the. Uh, not following my keen advice with this paper here, and I put it on the website. Um, so this is like the full-blown uh, dynamic structure model. This is still a work in progress, not fully, like we're not fully uh, satisfied with the empirical specification, but it, it's it's kind of there. This is where we started. And then we moved on to something that we, you know, it started as what we call the toy model. And and this is a paper that I'm, I'm going to cover uh, in detail now. Okay, so it's called Equilibrium Trade in Automobile Markets with the same set of co-authors, so Ken Gillingham, Fedor Ishakov, Anas Munk Nielsen, John Rust, and myself. Okay, so um, so what this paper, the toy model, okay, so the second paper here, what that does is we started with a this, wanted to build like a toy model so we can understand every little detail. Okay, so let's start with just completely homogeneous consumers, um, Everybody needs to own one car. Uh, all cars are the same. What are the pr how are the prices looking like? And then you know you move on from there. And then we add them more and more. And then, then so the current version of the model has the following. Okay, so we have new and used car, uh, new and used cars of multiple types that could be makes and models, and that are traded with heterogeneous consumers. So we have several types of consumers. Okay, so both me and John are there, and we can trade with each other. Okay, prices and quantities are determined endogenously to equate supply and demand for all costs and vintages along with the ages at which they're scrapped. So it's an equilibrium model with a, you know, equilibrium distribution of cars, uh, of ownership and holdings uh, of cars. Um, and we can analyze counterfactual effects of changing policy on both prices and the distribution of cars. Okay, so uh, then the model also allows for transaction costs, taxes, flexible specification of car characteristics, consumer preferences, uh, and heterogeneity, which um, uh, result in sorting into car uh, different uh, heterogeneity of consumers uh, allow for this sorting into different uh, into different cars in, in equilibrium. Okay, so so. Uh, I mean, we ended. We started simple. We're going to end with a pretty uh, flexible one. It's not like we got everything from from the from the outline. We didn't have a. It's not a life cycle model, so we we are not covering that. We don't have overlapping generations, and we are not working with a non-stationary equilibrium. It's we can assume a stationary equilibrium, so no waves in the distribution. So the uh, and the role for macroeconomic shocks are not put in in this model. But you have to start somewhere, and we can still analyze many interesting features of the car market with this model. So another thing that we, well, we haven't talked much about that yet is this uh, prices of cars. Um, well, that's determined at the international market for cars. Um, and so it's not only affected by the taxes, but it's also uh, affected by the competition between car producers. Okay, so one of the things you you see, saw in the first graph with the price in Denmark before taxes was actually pretty low because we are taxing those cars quite a lot. So, uh, but uh, we can potentially analyze that aspect of the car market with the using the last part of our model that introduced competition between producers of cars and thereby endogenizing the new car prices before taxes. Uh, using a comprehensive model of demand, uh, our comprehensive model of demand by forward-looking consumers. Okay, so you have an oligopoly between uh, uh, new car producers, and then you have forward-looking uh, uh, consumers who trade with each other at the secondary market. Okay, so 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 that's kind of you ended up that the toy model is more like a Death Star, uh, <laughs> if you will. You know, if you're happy with, with like to play with Star Wars, that's like. Uh, um, you know the the ultimate uh, you know killing machine, and and so the the tie grow pretty big here. Okay, anyway, so I'm going to show you your you you that. So we make uh, two stylized numerical example applications in the model. Um, so first, the revenue neutral replace placement of the new registration. 
uh, tax where we half the tax uh, registration tax and increase uh, fuel taxes, and then a hypothetic uh, hypothetical merger to monopoly um, experiment in the oligopolistic uh, new car market. So. Um, so, 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 well, that's in the paper. Maybe I'll say a few words here. I have some slides on it too, but, but details are certainly left to there. Um, we show that if with respect to number one, where we saw the revenue neutral, uh, replacement of the, of the new vehicle tax or reduction in new vehicle tax, it showed that accounting for equilibrium effects are really first order. I mean, if you're not accounting for equilibrium effects at the secondary market and design your policy, you may not going to make a lot of wrong inference. So one of the experiments we're doing is we're saying, okay, what happens if we just uh, we, re we we have the registration tax and when, then we say this 100% path through, so all ca our cars, also those of the uh, the used car market, is going to be reduced by the is same factor proportionally. Okay. Now, if you do that and assume that's the equilibrium price and then calculate the equilibrium afterwards, you're going to find out that you're going to put a big hole in the government budget because you're going to have half as much tax revenue as, uh, as you thought you would have it had you uh, designed the optimal um, uh, fuel tax rate according to the, um, um, according to the equilibrium model. Okay. So I'm going to go to details there, but but the bottom line is, when deciding tax policy, it is really absolutely essential to account for equilibrium effects in the secondary market uh, when you're looking at at durable goods. Okay. Uh, so another thing is, we show that for the second the hyper hypothetical merger to monopoly, we saw show substantial welfare losses from from this merger to monopoly uh, case. Um, Essential. What happens is that that the monopolist uh, will heavily discriminate uh, and uh, price discriminate and 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 then uh, primarily almost increase prices of the luxury uh, one of the cars so high that uh, that he only produces one of them. So you know um, we're going to get to that. So. Um, I'm going to go very, very quickly over the history of equilibrium uh, models, new and used cars. Okay, so this dates back to, to before we go to the model. Okay, so just to see what, where is all this coming from. Um, so, um, we, you know, Mansky and Berkovich, Jim Berkovich, um, they were the first to develop these equilibrium models for new and used cars. So we're going to build on their work. Okay, so um, what Jim Berkovich did in his uh, in his uh, uh, Rand paper from 1985, uh, new car sales and used car uh, stock and model of automobile market, was that he estimated uh, discrete choice demand models using the uh, National Transportation Survey. So he had he had uh, basically. A model for um, babe, uh, what car to buy, uh, consumers would buy, not only new, new cars, but also used cars. And then he considered um, uh, th uh, about uh, over 30, uh, 130 vintage, vintage type and, and age classes, uh, so different types of cars and different ages of class uh, of cars. And um, so 13 types and, 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 and 10 ages. Um, uh, over over an extended period. Okay, so um, so so he estimated these uh, low demand models, and then he used these demand models to predict what would the uh, supply and demand be at this market. Because if I'm owning a five year old car and buying another car, I'm supplying a five year old car to the market because someone else needs to buy it. So basically from the choice probabilities from this logit models, you can derive what both supply and demand is and therefore fall, form the excess demand um, that he calls E. Okay, so so in, in the excess demand is really a function of the prices because the choice probabilities in the discrete choice models is gonna depend on the prices, okay? And so that's gonna be an equilibrium uh, a vector of prices that's put supply equal to demand and and he used Newton's method to solve for that. Okay, we can do exactly the same here, except that our model is not a static model like Jim Berkovich um, um, model uh, was. I um, mean, so many. I mean, he was really ahead of his time with this work. Um, but of course, uh, doing full-blown dynamic programming. Uh, uh, with, with multiple uh, consumer types and 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 uh, and, and aging car, cars of different types was not a poss possibility at that time. But 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 if the equilibrium part here, that's really like a a, a real snack uh, 
you know, from the 80s. Okay, now and another branch of the literature, so this is not about estimation, it's like a theory paper, um, was some of John's work uh, from, from his thesis where he developed dynamic equilibrium models for, uh, for, for the car market. Okay, so uh, our paper is really building on, on that approach. You can say um, this, is, this, is, this is the starting point for the dynamic equilibrium uh, model of durable assets. Okay, he made some assumptions. He was working with uh, a, whole, a, a unit mass of consumers. He also had a, 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 a distribution of uh, heterogeneous consumers uh, in a version of the model. But we're going to start with the one that has homogeneous consumers. And then he studied the stationary flow equilibrium. Uh, where where the number of cars that are coming out and the number of uh, cars that are coming in are the same, uh, so scrap needs to equal um, uh, um, uh, 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 new car purchases, and then in the model there were no transaction cost and 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 there was a continuous quality of goods as, uh, as opposed to what we're gonna do. He he worked with the auto meter readings, uh, so that's like the mileage. Um, of, of the cars, we're gonna work with just the age of the cars because it's a, like a easier, it'd be, it'd be easier because it's a discrete, um, uh, it's a, it's a discrete deterministic transition, okay. And then there's no choices of how much to drive the cars, which is gonna take it as like a deterministic one, two, three, four, five hit transition uh, of, of of the age of cars, okay, until replacement. And then he showed that when transaction costs essentially zero, consumers trade every period for the optimal car and basically reduce the dynamic programming to, to a, a static one, and then you can solve for it analytically. Okay, so we get a build on that and then build more on top. So this was without transaction cost. Okay, and then Knossi and Stanford that went all the way to two thousand and two before someone generalized Rust analysis to uh, allow for potential transaction cost and just to prove the existence of an equilibrium uh, is extremely hard and allow for uh, and requires some pretty sophisticated math. Okay, one of the things that were difficult there was. Uh, um, with the fact that you working with this uh, continuous mile so we're going to work with discrete uh, stuff and essentially uh, combine uh, dynamic programming with with uh, with with the uh, Berkovich approach okay and then Stolyarov well Stolyarov he um uh, developed it's a JPE paper 2002 uh, developed dynamic equilibrium model with random transaction costs. So while they're not just proving the existence of equilibrium, he was he was comp uh, computing it and he got something called like SS rules. So so the solution for for the agent would be the optimal or uh, purchase age of a car. That's the S, and then uh, that's going to be uh, uh, another. Uh, 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 time when you want to to to, to replace a car, uh, it's going to be S plus tau, uh, and where tau is the holding time, that's going to be the solution for that model, and it's going to be different for different types of consumers. Anyway, so this is what Stolyar did, and he solved for the dynamic equilibrium with transaction costs. Okay, using uh, uh, some of those ideas. Okay, so and then Gavazza and uh, Alessandro Gavazza and Go co-authors they had a paper um, in in in. Uh, 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 American Economic Review 2014, where they used Stolyarov's approach to numerically calculate the equilibrium and analyze the impact of, of varying levels of transaction cost, and really showed that uh, uh, that the secondary market was uh, um, was key to understand uh, the impact of transactions cost. Okay. Um, or oh, transaction cost was was uh, was key also to analyze the effect of various policy. Okay, so Esteban and Shum, uh, they had a dynamic. They were moved forward and included the dynamic equilibrium, uh, a dynamic oligopoly model for the uh, for, to to model the new car sales. Okay, so the like for a dynamic oligopoly model for differentiated uh, product markets with equilibrium production dynamics uh, due to durability of goods. So this kind of related to what we're doing in there uh, in the second part. Uh, they they uh, uh, as they also uh, model the. Uh, uh, you know the product market uh, where where producers are taking into account that their goods are durable and traded at a secondary market. Okay, so here's here's a there's a whole literature that just focus on estimating the demand uh, for for uh, new vehicles 
and uh, I guess the Barrel Levinson and Pig is, is like the, uh, you know, the seminal paper that developed this BLP approach, also allowing for supply side effects and heterogeneity and so on. Well, what they are looking at there is usually, so these are models for product differentiation and consumer choice of new vehicles, uh, allowing for general patterns of substitution uh, for, for the consumers across different differentiated products. This is static models of consumer demand. And, um, and, and, and so are different of ours in that respect, okay? Uh, and it's a, a Bertrand, uh, but then you have this oligopoly side of the automobile market in the, with respect to the is consumer supply. So we can take actually the supply side, uh, something that's very similar to that from, from that literature, okay? But then we're gonna have forward-looking consumers that are trading in the secondary market. This is what we usually don't have in that literature. And then we wanna have something about the usage of cars. And, and Ken Gillingham, in his job market paper, he, um, he, he, he started to work with uh, uh, two-period models and take into account the consumer's expectations about future use of the product. So, um, so we're going to use that exactly that idea here. This modeling the uh, the, the second period. You model the um, um, the it, how much the demand for driving, if you will, by maximizing utility with respect to the utility of driving, and then uh, taking that into account, you take that into account when they choose your vehicle. And this gets some very interesting effects of of various policies when you analyze the uh, 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 when you take that into account. There's something called the rebound effect. So if you make a policy where you suddenly uh, uh, change the uh, make differentiated taxes or fee baits on on, uh, on on more fuel efficient cars, well, then you can have the effect of that policy that, that people, uh, uh, they are now driving even more in their cars uh, so that there is this rebound effect that because you reduce the, the prices of fuel efficient cars, uh, people end up actually driving more in total because now their uh, 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 the price of, of driving has also reduced and and this is called the rebound effect. So you end up with more uh, driving in the end by substituting the cars or more fuel consumption by by substituting cars that are, are more has a better fuel economy. So that's kind of you know it's important to take this into account. For our purpose, it's mostly really that we want to see the effect of tax and gasoline. We need to have usage, and they needed that too. These models, because they're static, because they're uh, you know static low to choice models, they can afford to have many more types of um, of cars, and so they look at at the uh, the. They lo look more at the, uh, they're really rich in the type space on many different, you know, makes and models and, and so on. But there's no secondary market and there's no uh, dynamics with respect to replacement of cars. Okay, so um, so that's the history and let's get started with the model. Okay, so here's a, the modeling uh, we're going to do. Uh, we're going to start, uh, in order to do the modeling of, of equilibrium trade in the automobile markets, we're going to start with... Uh, uh, Rust 1985, because okay, so the paper already mentioned. Okay, so the model for discrete by diversion with discrete goods, where uh, the state variable is going to be h of the car that just goes up one, two, three, four, five, and then there's going to be this model has no transactions cost, there's no outside options. So everybody needs to own a car, and then there's a, a continuum of consumers. Okay, okay, and and in, in in this starting point, all these consumers are going to be homogeneous. Okay. So this is this is going to be the starting point, and then I'm going to spend some time at deriving the um, uh, the, the equilibrium price function, and then from there we go and make extensions one by one. So this is really trying to learn from what Keith st said, start simple, and then add one thing at a time, and then analyze the effects one thing at a time, and see okay what is due to the out what is the effect of the outside option what's the effect of transaction cost what's the effect of consumer heterogeneity and we're going to do that so we're going to incrementally uh, increase our uh, extend rust model to include outside option um, transaction cost and uh, con con uh, iid consumer heterogeneity so that's the first step mm -hmm. then we'll look at time invariant or persistent consumer heterogeneity uh, that could potentially be time varying too. So you you know think about the income, right? That's really something that's persistent over time, uh, or it could be income types, or men and women, or you know. Um, then there is multiple types of cars. Um, so we have the type choice. 
uh, of the model. So not only different ages, but also different types of cars. And then we're going to add uh, driving and demand for gasoline, like uh, uh, Ken Gillingham and Anders Mugnilsen has worked on. And then uh, endogenous new car prices and oligopolistic uh, competition between car producers at the very end. Okay, so that's that's kind of you know the the plan. Okay, and somewhere here I'm gonna do a counterfactual from from this model or based on the Danish reform uh, after having followed the model until here because you know Denmark is a small open economy we don't need this part, and and then here we're gonna analyze the effect of a merger to monopoly situation once we have the uh, new car producers uh, and their competition in the model. Okay, so here's the starting point. So we got this unit mass of consumers who live forever. So it's an infinite horizon model, no life cycles. Uh, cars vary by their age that goes from zero all the way up to A bar. Um, cars must be scrapped at this capital A. Um, and by the way, I'm going to only have A bar, uh, uh, capital A here. And then from later on, I'm going to work with uh, a, a bar. Really, this you know, don't think about the difference. It's this is what the potential values of A could take, and this is actually meant to be the optimal scrap date. Okay, so um, so for now, just think about A bar as being the you know the the date where the car, car needs to be scrapped. Okay, so consumers they can trade with uh, they can choose the, one of the following options. They can trade um, um, the current car for uh, um, for, for a car. Uh, of, an, of another age, okay? So you come in with a car of, of age A, and then you can choose between uh, a new car, a one-year-old car, and all the way up to a bar minus one. You can't buy the, the oldest car because it's forced to be scrapped, okay? That's one option, you know, you can keep your current car, so we signify that by the choice being equal to kappa, okay, for kappa for keep, and you can do that only if your car is, is not at the scrap age, okay? Like I said, there's not going to be any outside option yet, so everybody needs to own cars in this economy. There's nobody, nobody cannot own a car. Okay, and we're going to relax that assumption later. But 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 this is the this is the starting point. Okay, um, car utility is decreasing is a decreasing function of utility. It's going to be that uh, of of the age of the car. Utility is decreasing in the age of the car to reflect that. Basically, you know, this decreasing de 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 utility of car surfaces, the car is just less nice to be in when there's no iPads and, uh, and you know, massage seats and, and, and all this cool stuff that is in uh, John's new car. Uh, but there's also another thing is, and, and, and I learned that because I, uh, I I got John's old car, there's increasing maintenance costs. So even though I got it for really cheap, the car, I had to visit this uh, Nepalese uh, work, um, 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 maintenance guy who had this nice workshop, um, Nani, um, down in Silver Spring, and he used a lot of my money, right, to to repair this car over and over again. I mean, this, the, the, I was lucky. It was not really like a, 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 a lemon that he, I got, but I had to do some repairs, okay? And these repairs, you don't have to do a new car. So the utility function here is downward sloping, uh, reflecting these two things, in decreasing utility and increasing uh, cost of maintenance. Okay, so here's a Bellman equation. The Bellman equation for the owner of a car of, of HA uh, is the following. And notice here, we are only going to look at states with uh, uh, from from the first one to to the to the uh, scrap yard. Okay, uh, not for new cars because they're never going to be evaluating the value of new car. And anyway, I'm going to go come back to that. Okay, so here's a value function. Okay, so if you come in with a car of H A, you can choose either to keep, which you get when in which case you get the value of keeping, or you can choose to trade, which is this thing over here. If you trade, this means that you sell your car and buy another one of another type. Okay, And the types you can buy is the brand new car all the way up until just uh, the car that is just before the clunker. Okay? You can't buy the clunker, the the H's A bar car. Um, yeah. Uh, let's just agree that everywhere where it says A, just, just think of A bar. Okay, so here's the value, the choice, um, uh, choice specific values if you have a car of age A. Okay, so if you keep it, so then you get the utility of the car that you're driving, that, that, you're, yeah, that you're owning uh, already because you're keeping that car. So that's going to be the car that you drive, the one you keep. Okay, uh, and then um, you're going to have the, um, the, the future uh, discounted 
expected value of a car that's one year older. Okay, now what is this alpha here? Alpha is the accident probability that can also depend on the age of the car. Okay, so uh, you only get the value of, of, of having the car next period if it's not an accident. So one minus the accident probability you multiply. If it's an accident, well, the car ages to, to, to the last uh, age and is equivalent to a clunger. So you get the value of a clunger in that case multiplied by beta. Okay. So this is the value of keeping. Now the value of uh, trading or buying a car or trading your car of type A to a type of uh, a car of, of age D um, is the following. Okay, so you get the utility of, of the car that you have chosen. Okay, so this is a car you drive. Um, and then you uh, have to, there's a, there's a utility cost um, so we work with quasi-linear utility here um, and th that uh, is reflecting that you have to pay for the, the car and that you buy, but you can you would also get money for the car that you're selling. So this is your the current car that you have. So this is basically the price difference between the new and the old car. So new and old car, right? And, and this parameter is measuring the marginal utility of money, okay? Now there's no transactions cost yet. So, 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 um, so basically you get utility net off the utility cost of uh, uh, the, the trading uh, cost of going from A to D. Okay, now you can always buy, I mean, there's nobody says you have to buy a more expensive car, so this could be negative, right? So if you, if you come in with a brand new car and you buy like uh, the clunker, then it's going to be negative and you could get money back. Then there's the, the same uh, future expected value, except the difference now being that what you're going to continue with next period is the car that you chose to, to, to buy, okay? Uh, just one year older. Okay. So I think um, uh, one thing that's, that's uh, worth noting here is uh, um, when A is equal to the, uh, the scrap age, Okay, or the, the last legal age of a car, keeping choice is no longer available. Okay, so you, you cannot keep the clunger. Okay, so you can't, you can't, you can't choose to keep this. This is not, not feasible. So in this case, you get um, uh, the value of the last component. And the right hand side simply just disappears. Here's a little bit about the timing of the events. So the, the consumers, uh, well, they come in with the, uh, the state variable A, you wake up in the morning, you know your car is A, then you make your discrete uh, trading, keeping decisions. That is, you choose between um, uh, whether you want to keep or whether you want to uh, 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 trade for a car of this type. Uh, and this immediately after the start of the period. Then the chosen car, that's a car that's utilized. As you can also see here, this is what you get utility from. Um, and, and then it could be potentially be involved in an accident. So that's why you have uh, these, these accident probabilities here with, um, giving different outcomes with respect to your car. Either it will be just aging one or it will be a clunger, okay? Um, and, and so uh, then by the start of the next period, with, with it, it will age, or if there's an accident, it will just be, uh, you know, the clunker, okay? So it's impossible to start a period, actually, this is worth noting, uh, with a brand new car, because, um, uh, because um, um, you can't have, or you can't uh, come, I mean, car, because cars are aging, and uh, because the next period state is going to be equal to the, the, the this um, uh, the car you bought plus one. So and since you can't buy cars with negative age, then A will always be uh, positive. Okay. I mean, you can always calculate what the value of having a new car is, but it's never going to be uh, evaluated in the dynamic program. Okay, because uh, it's not here on the right hand side, so you don't really need to have it there. It's plus one. Okay, so with this model, we can derive the implications of, of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, zero transactions cost here. Um, uh, we can derive uh, the value functions and, the, and find the implications of the zero, zero transactions cost. So, so if the price of a new car is given, okay, so let's call that P upper bar, this price of a new car, 
uh, we're going to take that as exogenous and then model it later, okay, as uh, um, in the oligopoly model, part of the model. But right now, just take it for fixed. And the scrap price is, is fixed as well, okay? So think of this as a price for metal uh, or, you know, the price of the scrapyard. Um, so suppose that. Um, and then um, with if there's no transactions cost, then the optimal policy A star of A um, for all the cars that could be in the state. So, so you know, the op this is the policy function, the optimal choice, right? That does not depend on A, okay? It, it, it's just irrelevant what car you come into uh, the, the model, uh, in, into the um, economy with. You're going to buy your preferred car. Okay, so it's independent, and and really, what happens in equilibrium is that people are indifferent, indifferent between different cars. Okay, so you can have that; it's totally independent of A. Now, with this, you can derive the value functions, and uh, it turns out that when there's no transaction cost, um, since it's always possible to trade for the preferred car, then the value of the preferred car, which we have here, is really um, um, the, the value of the preferred car is really the discounted uh, um, sum of utilities um, that you get from owning uh, the same car every period, net of the replacement cost it cost to replace that car over and over again. Okay, and 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 since there's no tr transactions cost at all then people will just line up and figure out what price uh, that would be an equivalent line up and figure out what what uh, type age of car they want and then just go for that every time okay and then there's going to be different consumers doing that for different types of cars and that's going to determine the uh, the prices in equilibrium those prices to make the values uh, equally high okay now here you got the value function which is value of the preferred car this is the value at, at any state, A, not at the preferred state, but at any state, that's the value uh, of the uh, preferred car minus the cost of getting that car, okay, when you have A. Now, um, we can use this to calculate the equilibrium. So the, the, the thing is, consumers must be indifferent than equilibrium. Otherwise, uh, either, consume, either consumers are not you know, following the optimal stra strategy or the holding distributions must be degenerate, okay? Um, so let's, um, I mean, uh, it's really hard to have, uh, like everybody is buying the same car, uh, then the economy totally collapses the next period, right? If, you, if the cards are aging one year after, it can really be the same stationary equilibrium the next period, okay? So, so, so that can, that's not really a, a, a stationary uh, equilibrium. So, so it, it is so that they are really indifferent, okay? So let, um, let A bar be the, the equilibrium scrap age and, and then satisfy uh, and then the prices satisfy, uh, like what I already said, you have the new car prices and you got the scrap price. Um, uh, and, 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 and so then the prices are trapped in between those uh, two prices. Okay. Um, so that's a, that's a, uh, that's must be satisfied in the equilibrium, right? Because, you know, you can always go out and buy a new car. Um, so if suddenly the used cars in between are, are, are suddenly, uh, uh, higher. Why don't you want the new car that has higher utility? And so, say uh, if the if the um, uh, if the price is is uh, suddenly uh, uh, lower than the scrap value, why don't you just scrap the car? Okay. So that that must that must hold an equilibrium. So um, this leads to a difference. Um, the value of um, and the people are indifferent, right? Then, then you, the value of any car D must be equal to the uh, value of a car that is D uh, D plus one, and that must hold for any 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 of the cars, okay, uh, all the way up to a bar, because you know you you uh, uh, you can't hold the um, there's no value of a, a bar plus one. So, and then we this with this. There's actually a set of uh, uh, equations here, right? Where we know what those where the what those equations look like, we can solve for them, right? 
So, um, and, and how many equations is there? Well, this one for zero, one up to eight by, um, by minus one that needs to be combined. And so that we use, lose one degree of freedom. And then we essentially have a bar minus one, um, um, one uh, uh, linear equations, right? Um, so, so with that, we can solve for these uh, used car prices where there's also a bar minus one unknowns. So you can you can actually you know it's actually a good exercise. Try to sit down, put in the equations here from this side here, put it into this system, and write it up for all the different values where it makes sense. And then you realize that this becomes a linear system of equations. You can write in this way, where where x and y are, are, are given here. Um, I'm going to come back to that. Um, and and then in order to uh, so, so here x's and y's essentially depends on uh, parameters of the model, that's x, and then uh, the utility function here, and the new car price and the uh, scrap price. Okay. Um, with those two matrices that you can form from primitives of the model, you can solve for x simply just by you know pre-multiplying x prime uh, x inverse on both sides, and you got the price system. Okay. So, so that's that's an, a linear, good linear algebra exercise. So solving the model really just uh, uh, amounts to uh, forming these two matrices and then solving uh, uh, solving this system of equations. Okay. So what do they depend on? Well, I, one thing I want to highlight here is I I here derive the set of equations where I put alpha equal to zero. Okay, just I mean the 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 the, the other case is in the paper, but it just makes algebra a little bit less uh, cluttered here and the notation a little less cluttered. Uh, but but generally uh, uh, making increasing the accident rate is just going to increase the uh, um, in, increase the discount uh, rate. Uh, um, uh, you know that's virtually what what uh, what happens here. Okay. Um, um, so so uh, or you know no increasing now is going to de decrease it. Yeah. So anyway, so um, that's in the paper. So you can solve this very easily. And and then there's a few things I want to say here. So we've until now, just assume you a bar is a parameter, okay, and you need that to solve this linear system, okay. Um, but you can easily solve a linear system and just vary what a bar is, and then calculate prices for many different values of a bar, and then see if they are satisfying the equilibrium conditions. And that's what we do, okay. So, um, and to, you know, so so we can solve it for many different a, and then just uh, uh, verify that uh, the prices are between the scrap price and the new car price, as they should be. Otherwise, it can't be an equilibrium, right? Um, there's no requirement on monotonicity or anything by the solution. Uh, the monotonicity of of the price function, so it's going to be uh, monotonically downward sloping. Uh, if the uh, utility function is downward sloping in H, and and you can actually see, look, you can see that when you look at at the uh, at at this Y here that has the utility uh, differences everywhere, so they're going to be positive all the way down if utility is downward sloping in H, right? So this is you know higher than this one, and 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 so on and so forth. But nobody says it has to be like that. I mean, it's like that because we're, we're looking at cars. But if you're looking at other goods that are not necessarily you know, ordered monotonically in the space, then uh, you can still solve for the equilibrium and then you would have prices for each of the goods and they're not necessarily downward sloping, but they would be between the scrap price and the uh, uh, top price. So there needs to be these outside options here, okay? Uh, that you can get rid of the good or uh, these or purchase this, this out, uh, outside good. Okay, so um, anyway, um, this is this is what we're gonna say about this, I think. Okay. Um, okay. So. So what should a bar really be? Okay. It turns out that a bar, the optimal value of a bar, should be what Harold Sucker would do. Okay. So when is it optimal to replace uh, the car? Um, so think about Harold Sucker as actually being, you know, he's the superintendent of maintenance. Why couldn't he be the social planner? Okay. So, so Harold Sucker, he would optimally, he would, that would be a cutoff age where he would optimally replace the engine. And that's exactly what the social planner would do. Now, if you determine A bar as the optimal date of replacement, um, you're going to figure out at the set of parameters we calculated the solution at, that this is after 11 years. 
Now, if you solve the linear system um, to get the prices, you're going to have uh, a curve here for every every value of a bar you choose. Okay, so I've checked some some values of a bar that are smaller than the optimal hair sucker value, um, and then we'll figure out here that prices they would have to decline much faster, right? If you have to describe their peak. Because consumers here, they're anticipating that next period, you have to scrap it. So it has to be less valuable, even though uh, you, you, you still derive utility uh, f from, from that good. You, you would have, the price needs to decline to hit the, uh, the price, uh, the scrap price, okay? So, uh, so when you solve the linear system, you see they're really trapped in between the new car price of 180 and, and, and the scrap price of 10 for all these different price systems, okay? And then as you gradually increase a bar, then you will see these price functions come closer and closer to the uh, scrap value, okay? Or, or to the, to the uh, equilibrium price. And this is, this is a way we can solve for the equilibrium price, just this iterative algorithm where we just, you know, uh, start with, um, uh, trying different values of, of a bar and solve the solution. Now, what happens if it's too big? Okay. Now, if if a bar is bigger than what Harris Sucker would suggest, well, then you get these curves here. Okay. So we have you know put a bar to 12, uh, um, uh, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 16. Uh, yeah, 15 too. So, uh, and what you see here is now the prices are suddenly coming below the scrap price. Well, this can't really be an equilibrium, right? Because uh, if I could, as a consumer, um, uh, if I had a car here that was, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 12 years old and you know equilibrium prices are lower than the scrap value why wouldn't I just go to the scrap yard with this car so this cannot really be an equilibrium another way to think about it is that this th if this is like an institutional constraint someone needs to hold that car until it's 16 years then you need to compensate the consumer that buys it for this high disk utility of owning this old clunger okay so so well, you know that's that's a pretty you know strong argument for you for following Harold Circuit and just choosing the optimal endogenous scrap. So and that's also you know it's easily to decentralize that uh, by individual decisions and this is what people do right. If they can't sell on the market, they're gonna scrap it and then equilibrium it's gonna be uh, um, uh, determined by by the red curve. Okay, so so this was all about homogeneous consumers. Let's move on and talk about heterogeneous consumers. So the unit mass, uh, we're talking about a unit mass of idiosyncratic heterogeneous consumers. Okay, so now they're, they're idiosyncratic heterogeneous. Okay, and guess what? The, the way they're going to be heterogeneous is we're going we're gonna to make, we're going to give them at extreme value shocks uh, that are time bearing uh, or, or, or to, to mimic this time bearing consumer heterogeneity. So just think about these being idiosyncratic shocks to investments. Okay, it could be something that's or a shock to the, what the consumer is, but it could also be you know, like a shock to you know, your experience of the car. Okay, so there's just idiosyncratic shocks to you want to get rid of your car, you want to get have a car of a particular type. Okay, so uh, uh, you know, idiosyncratic taste to reach. Now, the consumer choices and timing is exactly, exactly the same as before, except that. Uh, the assumption that cars must be scrapped uh, at adoption is determined uh, values of A, okay? Um, so, um, so, so we're going to determine that also in equilibrium, okay? So now, uh, what we really, what what are we adding? So we are still on the Mike Keen quest of stuff, you know, going simple to 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 general. Okay. So we add transactions cost now, and then we also add the outside good of not owning a car. So here's a consumer's trading problem. So uh, so what is new? What is new is is epsilon. Okay. We have epsilon here and here, uh, and you know ev everywhere. So that idiosyncratic shocks to uh, to the different choices. Okay. And, and that also means that now the value function needs this as an input for the state variables, okay? And we're going to, you know, integrate it out later and solve for the expected value function, but these are the Bellman equations, okay? So here it's one of the choice specific values. Um, so if the value of trading the current car of HA for a replacement car D, 
where you can choose new ones all the way up to uh, next to the clunger uh, is the following, okay? Or for the outside good. Oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, so so um, uh, you can also choose the outside good. If, so, so, so here, the, the value of the outside good is, well, that's a value, the, the choice specific value of not having a car and choosing the outside good, or the, the maximum value of having the outside good and then choosing to buy a new car. And this is also gonna be a Bellman equation for, for the value of um, uh, the value of a, uh, a clunger, that's essentially just li eliminating uh, the choice of uh, of keeping that car. So you you hear if you have no car, you can stay with no car. But if you have a clunger, you cannot uh, stay with a clunger. Okay. Um, and and here, if you have a car of car age, well, you can you can essentially um, uh, choose to keep it. Okay. Um, anyway, so let's look at the values, the choice specific values. Okay, these are the value functions. These are the choice specific values. Okay, so, so here's the value of keeping. If you keep a car of type A, well, you're going to get the utility of type A, and then you get the future expected utility of a one-year-old car, car that's, that's aging if it's not in an accident and, and end up in uh, as a clunger. Uh, if you don't have a car, well, and, and you choose to stay with no car, then uh, choose to stay with no car, well, then you're going to get utility of not owning a hard car plus being the, uh, the expected value of being without a car next period. Okay, so so here's the value of trading. Um, if you uh, basically, it, it, the th new thing here is that we have now added uh, the transactions cost in here. Okay, so this is the guy who, who take has a car of age, age A and, and buys a car of, of age D. So he gets utility of, of the new car. And then he has to pay uh, not only the, the trade cost, the di price difference between the old and the new car, but also the uh, transactions cost uh, associated with the trade. And here the trade, uh, the transaction cost that can depend on the prices. It could be, this could be um, transaction costs that are proportional to the value of the deal, or it could be independent of the prices. Uh, the, the bottom line is we can allow it to depend on P, A, and D, and you know, in any specification that you want. And then, you know, if, if discounted expected future value is the same uh, as, as before, okay? So, um, and then, well, you're, you're, if you don't have a car, well, then of course the, the price of the, the car that you're selling is gonna be zero. That's why this term is not there. Otherwise it's the same, okay? And, and so we won't, we won't solve for the value functions. We wanna solve for the expected value function Okay, and with the ID extreme value distributed errors, the expected uh, uh, value or the expected max operator is this lock, lock sum, uh, well known lock sum formula used so many times, right? So it's like uh, 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 the, the log, sigma times the log of the sum of the exponentiated value divided by sigma, where sigma is a scale parameter on that epsilon. Okay, and so since in here the choice specific values, each of them have the component EV, you know, it's appearing here, 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 and here, here, and here. So uh, since since EV is everywhere on the right hand side, it's really a mapping from EV to EV, and then uh, we want to solve for that fixed point problem. So really, the EV vector, the vector of the expected values for cars of age one up to eight bar minus one, <coughs> including a bar actually. So, so expect a value of that is a fixed point uh, to a contraction mapping, and this is a contraction mapping which can be calculated using successive approximations or VFI, or we can use uh, Newton conservative iterations, also called policy iterations, uh, to speed up the numerical uh, 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 solution time on the system. And that's actually what we're going to do. And it turns out, like in the nested fixed point algorithm, when we're estimating models like this, um, that that the, the Frechy derivative or the derivative of the Spellman operator is actually something that we're going to use for calculating the equilibrium. So, so what is a byproduct of the solution algorithm here is really also a byproduct, it really also something that you're going to use when you calculate the equilibrium uh, that when we're solving with Newton's method because we, we need that derivative. So we are reusing a lot of components uh, during the course of estimation.
uh, 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 equilibrium finding and then later estimation. Okay, so so here's the solution to the DP problem. Okay, so uh, that's the vector of the expected values, and then uh, from that we can calculate the value functions from the value uh, the choice specific value functions for all the different uh, discrete choices in the state dependent choice set. Remember, this is state dependent because. Uh, say there's some choices that are eliminated, like you can't keep the clunger, uh, and that d depends on on that age. So it's definitely state dependent. So given those uh, choice specific values, you can calculate the choice probabilities, which we're going to signify by pi. Okay, so here this is the probability of choosing, um, um, uh, choosing. Uh, 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 a car of type D when you have a car of type A and essentially you have your usual logit formula here, okay? And here, down here, you got the choice set like I've alluded to, if you if your car is not a clunger <coughs> and if you actually have a car, well, then you can choose to keep it or, or go for the outside option if you or, or buy any car at the market. Um, if you if you don't have a car that is a is equal to the empty set, or if you have a clunger, well then you have to go out and buy a, 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 a new car or just stay with the empty set, okay? Or just say stay without a clunger. So these are the choice set, and these are the choice probabilities. Okay, so let's move on here um, to defining the heterogeneous agent equilibrium. Okay, so again, we assume an infinitely elastic supply of new vehicles at price P. We define an infinitely elastic demand for scrap at price P under bar. Uh, so, so that's like before. Okay, so A bar, there's A bar minus one markets um, and giving uh, equally many prices, okay? <clears throat> so before we were solving some linear system, we can't do that now. That, that analytic solution is, is no longer viable because uh, essentially uh, consumers... Uh, optimal replacement strategies are no longer depend and no longer independent on the car that you have uh, because uh, um, basically this these transaction cost makes uh, Im impossible for you to or makes it costly to, to to you know trade every period for the same preferred car so you're not going to do that what we're going to do is we're going to solve the dynamic program and then we're going to bag out what the demand and supply is for those uh, uh, those solutions <coughs> Okay, so so what is the we, what we have here on the left hand side is actually the demand, and how is that composed? That is, this is the demand for 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 car type number one, right? Remember, this is the choice probability uh, uh, for a car uh, a, a, a consumer with a car type A, who uh, the probability that he's choosing car type number one, okay, or car H number one. Now, what is going on here is we're aggregating across all these different types of consumers. <coughs> and um, or or across consumers who have cars at different ages, and so this is really the total amount of people who demand car, uh, car age, uh, car no, car a uh, car of age one. Okay, so the demand for car for for car one. Okay, remember it says this is pi d uh, given a, the choice given the state. <coughs> now what do we have over here? We have one minus the probability of keeping. And this is all the people who are in state one. So these are all the car owners of car uh, with a car of H1. So this is <coughs> really the supply. It's everyone which is, has mass one minus the probability uh, that they keep. Okay, so it's an, uh, all the cars minus those that are not put at the market. This is the supply of car type number one. Okay, so there's going to be an equation like that for every type of car, uh, all the way down to eight bar. Okay, so this is a, this is the demand for type car eight, eight bar, and this is the supply for that car. Okay, so we can stack all those and put them into to a vector, and then we have like a a, 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 a vector of, uh, uh, of of equations. Okay, or we can subtract. Uh, uh, supply on, on both sides, so we get supply minus demand or the excess demand equal uh, with a vector of excess demand equal to zero. Okay, so that's that's the equilibrium conditions. 
And this is exactly what we're going to do. And now, you know, those of you who appreciated uh, Jim Berkovich's work will see we're doing exactly like he's doing. Okay, so we're going to basically take all these equilibrium conditions um, of, of smooth nonlinear functions. And, and, you know, they are smooth, right? Because these are logit formulas, right? And the expected values are fixed point on the smooth operators. So these are implicit functions of the P's also that are smooth, okay? So everything is smooth here, okay? So we're taking essentially... Um, uh, equilibrium conditions formed by these a bar minus one smooth nonlinear equations uh, and and uh, a bar minus one unknowns uh, that are corresponding to this uh, ex you know excess demand uh, functions one for each market one for each type or each of car and then you know you can write that in a little bit more useful notation here and just call that stack all those uh, excess demands and call that E D of P, okay, it's just to, for for short, and say that should be equal to zero, okay. Now, um, it should say E D here, okay, for excess demand. I think it's because first uh, Berkovich he uh, he he used E, okay, and we're gonna use E D for excess demand, okay. So since this is differentiable, we can essentially just use Newton's method to find a solution, just like Berkovich did, okay. So we're gonna use the standard iterative algorithm where you start with some prices and then you calculate the direction according to Newton's algorithm. And what is this? With well, this is the derivative uh, uh, or the Jacobian a bar minus one uh, squared Jacobian matrix. Um, that you invert and then multiply to uh, basically uh, the 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 uh, the vector of excess demands which you want to put to zero. So this is just a standard application of Newton's method, and this works really really fast and really 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 good. Okay, and the cool thing here is that the expression for these guys are actually pretty simple in this framework. Um, okay. So, so that's how you solve for the price system using Be Be Berkovich approach. Now we're not really done with, uh, that's just a part of the equilibrium, putting excess demand equal to zero. We also, we are looking for the stationary equilibrium, uh, not only the equilibrium where the prices are putting excess demand to zero and giving us uh, like a price vector, but we are interested in deriving the stationary distribution of mileage, uh, not a uh, stationary, distribution of um, of holdings and ownership distributions of cars, okay? So let, let H between 0 and 1 denote the fraction of cars of H A in the economy, okay? So this is like the holdings distributions. How many are there of, of each, okay? So if there's like A bar H's and there's a uniform distribution, this is just going to be 1 over A bar, okay? And, 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 and in fact, if, there, if all consumers are homogeneous and there's no, um, no accidents or anything, uh, or gradual scrappage or, or anything like that, then it's it's going to be exactly like that. Okay, uh, we're going to have um, we're going to have scrappage, so that distribution is going to be downward sloping, and eventually at the end there's going to be no uh, uh, no car. There's going to be fewer cars left than there were than there is are of, uh, of the older cars than there are the new cars, just like you see empirically. Okay, so the holdings distribution, which is a vector in R uh, to the power of uh, in, 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 in R a bar, uh, represents the age uh, distribution of the car fleet. Okay, so, so that's, uh, this is about the cars. It's a, uh, uh, it's a distribution of cars in the economy. Okay, and age changes from period to period due to deterministic aging of the cars and due to stochastic accidents. Okay, and we can put that right back into the um, um, it, it, we can formalize that with, with, with a transition matrix for that uh, uh, distribution. I'm going to show you that in just a second. And then age that's measured in the beginning of the period before trading and before aging. Um, so, um, um, and therefore, uh, according to the timing conventions, it does not have a new cause. Okay, so we're going to start with, it does have car, the clunkers because they can disappear, but... Um, but there's no there's no new cards in this in this uh, new distribution, okay? In this uh, in the distribution. So this also means that when you look at the physical transition matrix or, or aging matrix, or that uh, for, for the for the uh, for the cars uh, that that's the matrix you're gonna that determines really what the aging distribution is or or the uh, holding distribution of age is, which is like a, a, the um, uh, the agotic distribution from this macro uh, process or macro transition matrix. 
Um, it looks, uh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. So it looks like this, this, this physical aging transition matrix. Let me just, you know, say a few words about this matrix. Okay, so this is, this is today, and this is tomorrow. Okay, so this is a car coming in today, uh, and, and, and this is the age of those cars tomorrow. So each row represent here um, the age of the car. So you got one, two, three, all the way up to A bar. Okay, and likewise here you got one, two, three, all the way up to A bar. Important that we start with one and not with zero. Okay, now what is this doing? Okay, it's saying that if you come with a car with uh, age one, where will it end tomorrow? So it would, if it's not an accident, it would be two years old, or if it was an accident, it would be a clunger. Okay, so this is just governing the transition of the uh, of the uh, aging of the cars in the economy. Okay, now we gonna have uh, you know we can take another example. Two years old car is gonna be three years old, and that's why you have all this th stuff in the diagonal. And then in the end, at some point here, well, then you get no matter what you do, if you end with the uh, car that are at, at age a bar minus one is gonna be a clunger next period because either one either it's an accident, if it's not an accident, it's just deterministically aging. So 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 and, and so it makes sense, right? And everything here should sum to one. These are transition matrices. Now the last row is required for the flow equilibrium to hold. Okay, so what is this? Now this is for the clunker, right? So if if you come with a clunker, it's gonna be new next period. What does that mean? If it's an, if it's not in an accident, well, it means that for every car that is disappearing in the economy, then must get another car in. Otherwise, it can't be a an equilibrium. So this is like a flow equilibrium condition, okay? And then of course there's a probability that uh, that, that this uh, new car uh, uh, that that the clunker was transferred into will become a uh, a clunker right away if it's if it's in an accident. So this is basically the physical probabilities, the transition matrix that you have for the car market with uh, um, that we're looking at right now. Okay. Now in stationary flow equilibrium, the holdings distribution must be invariant, must be an invariant distribution. Okay. So so this is what we're looking for. So we're looking for the ergodic distribution of this transition matrix. Essentially, this equation needs to hold. So if you apply the the, the uh, uh, physical transition matrix to the distribution, well, you should get the same distribution other, out. Otherwise, it's not really, you know, a stationary equilibrium. So really here, you can just solve this equation and you can, you know, the methods to solve, to solve uh, fixed point equations here. So, um, um, you can you could actually solve this by a successive approximation. So you start with some guess of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the distribution. You can say it's uniform, um, and then you apply this matrix here, and then you get what would come out in next period. Okay, and then you just apply it again, and then you know see if it converges over time, and then converges to this stationary distribution uh, in the long run. Okay, so that's one interpretation of what's going on. You know, just solve this equation by successive approximations, and it's going to converge to there's a unique fixed point if there's accidents. Okay, now is this not accident? It turns out that age is actually periodic, and the only dis uh, invariant distribution is actually the uniform. So you can you would have to like guess and verify and then put in the uniform distribution here and check if the equi if the um, if the uh, equation holds and it will okay otherwise you have a programming mistake so here's the uh, stationary equilibrium at the automobile market okay so it, it, it here is just formality is uh, it's a tuple of of a bar which is a scrap age it uh, a price vector and the distribution of uh, 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 ownership distribution of of cars um, sorry, this should be actually the holdings distribution. This should be H, but but uh, here it doesn't make it uh, a difference. They're going to define Q later on as being uh, the part with the outside option inside. Um, anyway, so so um, <clears throat> uh, the price function here uh, uh, satisfy the infinite elastic assumption, so that the prices are uh, in between those two: uh, the scrap price and the new car price. Uh, for all the car vintages that are traded at the market, okay, and um, yeah, here it it should be for actually that big A here. So that's actually a typo. Anyway, uh, let's move on. So so basically, there's a price function trapped between the scrap price and the uh, uh, and the pr price of a 
uh, of a new car, this is P upper bar, and then the stationary holdings distribution H is an inner fixed point on as a fixed point on on this uh, H transition matrix that we looked at here, right? Okay, so you can derive that from from simply just uh, uh, you know sol oh, sorry solving this fixed point equation, okay, with the physical transition matrix as uh, per parameterized by the model, and you can calculate that from from the you know knowing the aging uh, prob uh, the accident probabilities and and how cars are aging and so on. Of course, it's another model. It's another it would be another matrix. Um, consumers follow then their optimal trading strategies, which essentially means they are solving their Bellman equations, and from that you can calculate the choice probabilities, and from that you calculate the market clear conditions, the excess demand, and then you just put that equal to zero. Those excess demands solved by Newton's method. Uh, if you want to solve for the equilibrium, make sure they are satisfied, and then find the ages between one and 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 it's find the prices uh, for for all cars aged between one and eight bar minus one. And then we also need to to keep another condition here that the number of people in the outside good is going to be stable over time. Okay, so so it is, so so people are not the fraction of people in the outside good uh, is going to be the same uh, ac across time periods. Okay, and and then the demand for new cars equals the supply of scrap cars, which is essentially what we. Um, um, where do we impose that? That was the last row here in the H matrix, okay? The flow equilibrium condition, okay? Um, so, so that's pretty much the stationary of the uh, stationary equilibrium on the automobile market. It has this uh, feature, okay? Now, um, the stationary ownership distribution. Um, so we've talked about the uh, the holdings distribution, but there's also an, an ownership distribution. And without the outside option, the 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 basically the holdings distribution age is both the age distribution of the car fleet and the distribution of owners who consume cars of different ages. But as long as uh, the minute we talk about it, people, some people not having a car and being the outside option, well, you need to discriminate between those two distributions. I mean, the distribution of of um, of uh, of ownership. Um, um, uh, the distribution of uh, consumers who own cars in different vintages Q, Q, and then the holdings distribution, the distribution of, of basically how many cars are there of, of, uh, of each uh, type or of each age. Okay, so with the outside option, there's this additional element in the holdings distribution or this additional uh, factor to calculate what is the fraction of uh, consumers who do not own a car. And then they basically can define the ownership distribution Q as given by um, basically the ownership distribution, uh, the holdings distribution multiplied by the uh, probability of or the fraction of consumers who do own cars. And then the last element is the fraction of consumers who does not have a car. So it's, it's like to one of those things that are uh, important to define, especially when you're implementing on a computer and being pre precise about this. Okay, so all this stuff is in the paper. Uh, as a holdings distribution age, Q is measured at the beginning of the period before any trading or aging is, is, is going on. Okay, and in stationary equilibrium, both our age and Q are actually time invariant. So let's look at this, uh, the dynamics of the ownership distribution. The dynamics of the ownership distribution is governed by, by this block the echelon matrix is very similar to what we have before. We just need another element, right? So, so we got age. This is like the physical uh, transition matrix for, for cars in the market. Okay, and then we got an, a last row here to, to, to deal with the people who are in the outside. But essentially with this Q here, putting a one here is saying the number of people in the outside good, not owning car, not must be stable over time. Okay, so that's why we have this uh, additional element and uh, then the um, dimensions fits and so on. Okay, now changing uh, an ownership, this is, this is essentially the physical transition of the uh, ownership distribution. Um, uh, but but in order to learn about trade and 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 and, and keeping behavior and and um, um, then we have uh, we define this uh, 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 transition matrix or demand transition matrix for the uh, for the car market. So this, this basically uh, this is the trade uh, that will go uh, that will happen during the. Um, 
uh, during the, uh, from one period to the next is captured by this matrix, which is composed of a matrix of, of, of uh, keep probable, it is, uh, a keep transition matrix, delta K, which is a function of the price vector. And I'm going to show you that one in a second, exactly how it looks like. Uh, and then to trade a uh, transition matrix delta T. Okay, so this is like a transition matrix. They have the same size, add them together. Either people keep or they trade. Uh, and that, that, that combination of those two actions is going to be uh, describing the uh, transition uh, after trade, so to say. Okay, so after trade has been going on, where people either keep or trade their cars. So it's a trade uh, transition matrix. As you can see, this is, this is a basically composed of uh, a bunch of choice probabilities. Okay, so the, remember the first element here signifies D, the choice, and then it's conditional on the H. Okay, so... Um, First column here is who is choosing uh, uh, age of car one of, and second one of car two. So you got one for each of those cars you can choose to buy. And then uh, the next to last element is actually special here because it's it's reflecting the equilibrium flow structure that uh, that that um, if you uh, if if you get rid of your car, well, someone must uh, uh, buy a new car. Okay. And then um, the, the, these are the people essentially the outside option, okay? So, and then there's one for each uh, uh, each state, including the outside option, essentially. So this is the trade transition matrix. And, and you can say, okay, so, so uh, if you apply that to the number of people who own a car of type one, which is this, and it's gonna be multiplied to this car, and then tomorrow, uh, this row is gonna contribute with the probability, all these uh, different probabilities, namely, uh, the, uh, the 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 prob conditional probability of buying a type one car if you are coming with a type one car times that probability. So you know you can see the mechanics which you sit down and actually you know think about what this uh, matrix actually means. Okay, and then we're gonna have a keep transition matrix which is actually like a diagonal matrix here. So these are the probabilities of keeping conditional on each of those different ages. That's gonna be on the diagonal. Okay. So, so that is uh, if uh, uh, the number of people that keep is essentially, uh, if you multiply this with the distribution of cars, then you're going to get the people, uh, or the number of cars that are not going to be put on the market out here, simply just by uh, multiplying those, uh, the, uh, the, uh, multiplying this matrix with the uh, distribution. Okay. So, I mean, it, it takes a little bit of time to work out, but you can see actually here, if you take the uh, the ownership distribution, multiply with this, uh, with a trade matrix, what you're gonna get is actually demand, okay? Just like, uh, you know, you can extrapolate for the example where I wrote out the demand equations, but really what it is, is Q times this is gonna be the aggregate, uh, it's gonna be the demand uh, at the given set of prices, okay? Likewise, you had, this is corresponding to the left-hand side of those equations we wrote up in a simpler way. So all this stuff here, right? It's gonna give you the demand, right? And then supplies was one minus a key probability. And so this idea totally generalizes here. So you got uh, the idea, the, the, the um, and one minus a key probability, and then you multiply with how many people there are, and you get the supply, right? Okay, so you know supply. That's all the cars that are not kept, that uh, that are not being kept at home. Okay, so then you got uh, demand minus uh, supply. You can subtract these two from each other. You get the excess demand, and and has this formula. Okay, so you know the, 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 this is the power of matrix algebra. It makes things real, really you know uh, short and easy, and you can easily see how you can uh, from these uh, trade transition matrices you can form what the excess demand is, and it would be easy to differentiate these these things and so. On, okay. Now here uh, we have this is the first condition, so you get need to have this condition first. Then there was uh, some more elements in the in this in this trading matrix, right? Because you had uh, you had this second to last element here that was uh, put in for, to have the flow equilibrium condition. Um, uh, and the, the last one is, is the number of people in the, in essentially in the outside option, the people choosing the outside option. Okay, so that's that's essentially what you have here, right? So this is the demand for essentially uh, new cars, right? Because um, um, uh, basically uh, the, the in, in flow equilibrium demand, then the people who are supplying um, uh, clungers to the market for every car that is, 
uh, put in the market uh, of, of clungers, well, then you need to, to get new cards into the market in order to establish flow equilibrium conditions. Subtract those two, you get F, which we call the flow equilibrium condition, needs to be satisfied. It's put equal to zero. And then there's going to stationarity in the outside good sure. And again, you just, you know, t take those two uh, differences, um, the, you know, the number of people who would like to be uh, in the outside good. And, and, uh, 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 and, and then here down here, you would have all, uh, all the number of people who are in the outside good, but would like to be somewhere else. Okay. So, um, so, so that's uh, stationary uh, um, after trade. Okay, so so th these these things need to hold, and once you, those market clear conditions are satisfied, well, then you have an equilibrium. Okay. So, so this is you know kind of you know the essence of all this. Okay, so you know this is a, the, these are the key equations when you you want to look at when you when you're doing implementation of this. Okay. Now, so here's a uh, um, here's a, a theorem um, from from about the stationary stationary equilibrium with idiosyncratic heterogeneity. Okay, so the stationary equilibrium for automobile economy with the idiosyncratic heterogeneous consumers like we have with the ID extreme value shocks in, in equilibrium, uh, it 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 holds that the stationary distribution. Uh, uh, um, uh, the stationary ownership distribution Q is equal to the um, stationary uh, uh, dis distribution after trade. Okay, so so you can apply the trading matrix to the distribution, and you get the same thing out. So it's going to be a fixed point on on the uh, um, on the trading matrix. So so delta p really represent the distribution of the holding uh, time this immediately after trading, and that's going to be constant. Uh, in equilibrium, okay, so uh, you can you can it should be verifiable, uh, and then the uh, this is another um, uh, uh, this is another transition matrix. Um, um, so so it's also time invariant, which just age the cars, right? Um, in in the stationary equilibrium, but it's also uh, it's time invariant when you have this aging and trading at the same time. So, so this matrix here is another market transition probability matrix that represents the evolution of the ownership distribution. That is also invariant in equilibrium. Okay, now, now this proves, this the theorem we're proving here is proving existence of the equilibrium, but we see uniqueness in virtually all uh, computations and, and you should be able to, uh, you know, using fixed point theorems to show that this is also actually a unique equilibrium. Uh, we have just haven't done that. Okay, so the excess demand for the outside good, this is something that we, 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 we need to calculate. Okay, so I'll just want to dwell on how you solve for that. Basically, one of the equations that ensures the excess demand for the outside good is zero is this additional, uh, you know, uh, uh, restriction that the number of people in the outside goods should be constant in equilibrium. If you write that out and, you know, from, from the elements in the matrix, you're going to get this equation. And here you can uh, simply just, uh, you can verify that that there's an analytical solution for, for the share of the people on the outside good that you get from solving this equation here. So uh, actually, I think we write out the, the equation in the paper, but this is the equation it's der der derived from. Okay, so, you know, that'd be a nice exercise to look at. Okay, so similarly, the, uh, uh, the equations that ensure flow equilibrium uh, needs to be needs to be satisfied as well. Okay, so I want to talk now about the computational algorithm. Okay, so, so the smoothness, uh, uh, this requires smoothness. Okay, so we have a lemma in the paper that shows that the fixed, unique fixed point of the smooth Bellman operator gamma um, uh, that defines uh, the mapping from expected values to expected value um, and, and both that, both that fixed point, the Bellman operator itself, the choice specific value functions, and the choice probabilities pi that enter into the trade transition matrix, and the trade transition matrix delta p and its subcomponents are continuous differentiable functions of p. So this really makes everything nice and smooth. And the bottom line is you can use Newton's method and gradients-based solvers to find uh, the solutions and stationary distributions and, and, and whatnot. Okay, so um, then uh, here the derivative of the Bellman operator that you need in order to, to calculate, um, um, uh, to find the equilibrium. Um, <clears throat> uh, then, uh, this this uh, uh, this expected value functions a unique fixed point of the smooth Bellman operator gamma, and then the Jacobian matrix of with uh, 
of gamma with respect to EV um, uh, is is the following. So it's, it's again, it's just like we've seen in the single agent models uh, in Hera circuits, beta time the uh, the transition matrix that moves the economy. So let's like uh, here, uh, it's the combined transition of trading and uh, and and physical aging uh, of the car. Okay, so so that's actually a pretty simple derivative. Okay, so you, it's going to be pretty useful. Okay, so here's the here's the essentially the computational algorithm. Um, so basically, you start computing starting values for for the prices by doing uh, the equilibrium search problem for solving the consumer prices uh, um, from the homogeneous consumer economy without any transaction cost. So this is remember the, the linear system of equations that derived, that gave us the choice prop uh, that gave us the price, downward sloping prices by inverting matrices. Well, you can do that for different values of a bar. Let's just scroll fast, you know, fast back. This is this is the system you're solving, right? This this system and down here with x's and and y's like this gives you uh, basically price curves essentially like this, and for many different values of a bar, you find the optimal one, okay? Like we just talked about. Once you have that. That's an excellent starting value guess for the price function in the model with, um, uh, oh, let's get back, with uh, transactions cost and consumer heterogeneity. It turns out to be a really, uh, actually a really, really good guess. Okay. So um, once you have, so this is your good guess or your starting value. Start with the, uh, and, and, and essentially that's a general advice, right? You start with the, uh, with a solution for the simpler model that you can solve that is nested in the problem you're looking at, okay? Okay, once you're, you're doing that, then you solve for the stationary holdings distribution H as an invariant distribution of this holding matrix or the physical aging matrix that we derived, the one with the off diagonal elements where, with all the accident probabilities and so on, okay? So uh, with that, um, once you have the holdings distribution, then the number of people in the outside share, right? Then you can use Newton's method to solve for the equilibrium prices. Okay, so how do you do that? So first you solve for the fixed point EV using uh, Newton's method. Okay, and we've just derived what the derivative of the Bellman operator is, right? It's right down here. Um, and, and then from the trade matrix and uh, form the trade matrix well, you need that uh, already up here. And then you compute the number of people in the outside here, okay? So there was a formula uh, back here that you should use, right? Uh, where is that? Um, where is that? Where is that? Um, it's after all these equations. Here it is, here it is. Uh, so you should use this and, and solve for, 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 for the outside here, okay? And we have an analytical solution in the paper for, for that, okay? So here, uh, then we form Q and compute the ownership distribution Q, which now is a function of, of the price vector that you found in the equilibrium, and then uh, for your, your current guess of, 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 of the price vector, um, and then A bar, okay? So that's, um, um, you, you solve for that. And then you compute the excess demand function in matrix form and, uh, and find the equilibrium price vector. Okay, so now you have a new price vector and, and then you, 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 you calculate uh, basically the, uh, uh, set the excess demand to, to zero. Okay, so here, first solve the model using Newton's method. As a byproduct of that, you get the, uh, the actual the Frechet derivative of the Bellman operator. Um, and then uh, you can use that later. And then you got you compute the outside option, you compute the distribution, then you compute uh, the, the, the ownership distribution. And with that, you can combine the trading matrix and the keeping matrix that you've computed so far and, uh, and, and to derive excess demand in matrix form. And then you minimize that with respect to those prices, okay? And then you iterate until convergence um, over a bar. 
Okay, so you do this again and again. This is really solving for an uh, equilibrium given a bar, right? But then this may not be the optimal a bar, so you have to go back and do it again, okay? And then basically you, you iterate over a bar until you find the maximum a bar such that the prices satisfy the equilibrium condition that is uh, between the new car prices, a, downwards, uh, a monotone, and uh, um, well, the, essentially just between the new car prices and the scrap price, okay? And then we conjecture that this maximal equilibrium is actually welfare maximizing, similar to the homogeneous case, uh, as we also show in the paper. Okay, so let's do an example. Okay, so um, here, and this is something you could try to replicate and code up, you know, with this formulas. Um, uh, consider the following specification of the economy where there's uh, um, um, uh, the following prices. Okay, so you got and you got i extreme value uh, uh, dis distributed uh, in discretic heterogeneity. So everything that we have on the previous slides applies. Okay, prices, new car prices are two hundred. The scrap price is a hundred. You got a utility function that starts with sixty and then declines in age with slope five. You got marginal utility of money of one. Discount factor point nine five. You got the scale of the EV shocks to up to 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 five. Um, and then you got a con this con transaction cost function one and a half plus three percent of the price of the car that you buy. Uh, so see, this now depends on on uh, uh, not depend on D, but uh, on A. But it could right. So it could also be the car that you sell, or you know the price difference, or whatever you want to specify. So this is how we specify it here. And then there's an accident probability that's increasing. Uh, basically, with with the age of the car to reflect, you know, increasing pro probabilities of breakdown. Okay, so here is the uh, basically the heterogeneous agent equilibrium, and this is what you will get with uh, uh, heterogeneous consumers, where we have allowed for. Uh, um, uh, this is a, uh, a, a equilibrium where you have uh, these ID extreme value shocks, and actually also the uh, the transition um, the transition uh, or, or, or transactions cost. Okay, you get these two different price functions. But even with transaction uh, with some transactions cost, you, what you see here is a homogeneous uh, uh, economy is that the prices are higher. Okay, and why is that? That's because it's a value to all the consumers that you can trade with each other um, uh, because there are. Uh, gains from trade. There are different consumers, so you know uh, that some people just value the cars more than uh, than than others out there. So you, it's actually little, that's a, that's a, actually an illustration of the gains of trade in this model because of the consumer uh, heterogeneity. Then you got a heterogeneous agents uh, equilibrium ownership distribution. Well, so here the holdings distribution. I guess this is this is the age function, um, and and then you got the number of people in the in the uh, uh, outside share, so this is the age empty set, okay, and, and then the uh, the holdings, the ownership distribution. Well, that would be uh, you know very similar to this one, but then the the first part would just be multiplied with one minus uh, uh, this guy over here, um, and and then this would be the last element, okay. So so this is a, like the holdings distribution age that we can derive. And, and see, because of the accident, then it's like this uh, downward sloping uh, decay of uh, the relative car stocks because they're disappearing from the market. And then here, we, uh, to discuss the different equilibria uh, for different values of A bar. So remember, I, I we suggest that you initialize the algorithm with the homogeneous consumer economy equilibrium with the optimal scrap age. And then that's that's the price function that you get here, right? But then the maximal equilibrium, it turns out that you can actually increase a bar to 12. And then you still get a downward sloping, um, or you still get a, a price function that is in between the, um, uh, the initial price and the, um, um, and the uh, what is it, the, um, uh, the scrap price, and by the way, I shouldn't point to this axis here because what you have here is the expected utility, and the whole point here is it's actually welfare maximizing, it's Pareto improving for all people in the economy. Okay, so so if you look at the the uh, lower value of the um, um, the lower value of, of of a bar that is the optimal value in the homogeneous consumer economy without transaction cost. Then for every value of a, for L, every value of a, for all car owners, the expected utility is actually higher in all points uh, if you let the age uh, e increase to 12, a bar equal to 12 instead of 10. 
Okay, so this is actually showing that this is a Pareto improvement uh, to to increase it. Okay, um, and it also shows that you know there is gains from trade. Okay, utility expected utility is just higher in this economy where uh, cars are kept longer because of the gains from trade, um, and and so on. Take a look at the stationary equilibrium with time invariant heterogeneity or time persistent heterogeneity. Okay. Suppose there are n types or uh, fixed types of consumers of type tau um, that are indexed from 1 up to n tau. Okay. Um, so, um, and then let uh, f of tau be the fraction of type tau consumers in the economy. So, this f here is, is the distribution of types. Okay. And then there's going to be uh, choice specific value functions and choice probabilities that are specific though to those types. Okay. So, you know, everything is before is just we have a different index and then we can have tau uh, affect utility. So, you can have choice specific, uh, type specific utility functions. Maybe some consumers have a, a lower market utility of money, like, like John would have, or the, compared to me, who has very high uh, market utility of money because I don't have any money. Okay. So, so, so that could be true different types for instance okay and then um, how do you define an equilibrium in this case okay so so this is what we're going to look at now so the trading matrix again since the choice probabilities including the key probabilities are now type specific it's going to be type specific again okay so this this uh, delta p we have before is going to be now indexed by tau and be the demand transition probability matrix for now a type tau consumer okay and they're going to be uh, uh they, they have different trading behaviors, so they're going to be different trading matrices. Then there's also going to be a, 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 uh, a holding distribution for each tau, right, that, that keeps track of how many co consumers of type tau that hold the different types of uh, uh, cars. So, so say, uh, um, then this is like a vector with the, the same number of elements as, as we had before, right? Um, one for each car. Okay, that denotes the fraction of the consumers that own or of the type tau consumers that own this car. Okay, and then the stationary uh, distribution of that uh, h tau is then simply given by um, uh, the uh, the stationary distribution of this this aggregate uh, 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 trading matrix. Okay, so we call this. Uh, the stationary holdings distribution for for tau tau for type tau consumers. Okay, this is the holdings distribution, and that's going to be one for each type. And then here in equilibrium, you can derive the uh, uh, we can derive the the aggregate holdings distribution by summing over all the different types and weighting with the with the uh, type probability. Okay. And now here, a h tau is a sub vector in the type specific ownership distribution Q that also exists. Okay. Remember that this has additional element uh, with the fraction of people in the outside share, um, uh, the outside good. Um, and then uh, th this one here is uh, the the the, uh, the type specific ownership distribution is a fixed point on the invariant is a is a uh, invariant distribution on the transition probability matrix uh, delta tau t uh, times q. Okay, so uh, this delta tau uh, I believe I had a slightly different notation here. I put it inside the bracket, but it's the same thing. Okay, sorry about that. And, and so this equation must hold uh, in, in, in equilibrium, okay? Now, this, this uh, and, and there's a theorem that shows that. One of the things that are different to the per persistent, uh, to the uh, idiosyncratic uh, case where, where we just have the epsilon shocks is that, that now it doesn't necessarily hold that the holdings distribution for a given type um, uh, is, is invariant to, to trade, right? So this is a trading matrix, even in stationary equilibrium, right? So, so here's an example, right? The excess demand for a given customer of type tau is generally not zero, right? Because who says I'm, I'm, I'm trading with the same type of consumers? Uh, so that could be net trade between different types of consumers in the economy, like like uh, John was selling his car to uh, uh, the poor economist. So the, his type distribution after trade may be very different because he's selling new cars, and and my my trading distribution is very different because I'm buying used cars, okay, from 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 those cars. So so this is. Um, so this is this is a difference uh, compared to the to the um, to the t uh, equilibrium where, where there's no uh, you know time invariant types.
Okay. Um, the stationary equilibrium is really just a, a, a computed um, by an algorithm that's sli only slightly modified. The inner steps have to be formed just for each consumer type, obviously. So you loop over all the different consumers to find all those, uh, for instance, all those uh, uh, um, um, invariant dis uh, distributions uh, to the trading matrix, the, the type-specific ownership distributions. Um, so, so that has to be done for each type, and also the the model, the the uh, uh, the, the Bowman equations have to be solved for each type, uh, and so on and so forth. And then there's a new step to aggregate the uh, specific uh, uh, type specific quantities, uh, like for example this equation here. Okay, so you need to aggregate over the, the number of types when you have solved all those uh, uh, holdings distributions. And, and then uh, the type-specific holdings distribution is actually computed as a separate fixed point with two inner, uh, with, with, within the inner loop instead of outside the inner loop. Um, uh, but otherwise, everything uh, remains exactly the same. So one thing that, that, again, is key to verify is the smooth of the type-specific ownership distributions in, in, in the prices. And uh, that is also uh, satisfied. And there's a lemma showing that in the paper. Okay. So you can use Newton's method and you can uh, uh, find uh, stationary distribution, invariant stationary distributions and see how that changes uh, with P very easily. Okay, so, um, um, so here's another example. So the same parameters as before, but now they have two types, rich consumers who has a, a low marketing utility of money, and then you have poor consumers who has, has a higher marketing utility of money. The outside good or utility is, is, is zero. 50% of the consumers are rich, 50 are poor, and then we just compare the heterogeneous consumer uh, um, uh, the, the heterogeneous equilibrium to, uh, to homogeneous equilibrium with consumer uh, of each type, okay? And then compare high and low transaction cost equilibrium. So, so here, let's start with, you know, normal transaction cost, the same as we had before. And what you see here is the blue curve is a heterogeneous consumer economy uh, where you get prices that are... Um, uh, when you when you get the, 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 this this price function here, okay. Now um, see it. It's really the case that if you look at the the type one, which are the rich ones, right? They would have scrapped the cars in the uh, right here very early, but then because they can sell the cars to the um, to the poor guys, well, then they get to live longer. And actually, the poor, poor guys end up buying more cars. You will see that in the next graph and. And, and hold on to the, these cars uh, uh, until the age of 16, okay? And, 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 and um, this case is the same. If there's transactions cost, that is, we are now shutting down part of that trade to be uh, being more costly to trade. Um, and, and so uh, now the heterogeneous consumer economy um, moves, moves uh, uh, back here in terms of how long time you will hold the cards and the, and the prices also falls because there's not any of those uh, poor consumers to keep up the prices uh, of those uh, of those cars in the economy that the rich consumers are buying. So, so the the, the curve here in the heterogeneous consumer economy kind of shift and it lowers the prices by increasing the transactions cost. Okay, so I mean these are the prices before the transactions cost, but but this is uh, uh, in how much the rich consumers get out. Okay, so so this can be less. Uh, lower prices and presumably also less trade. Okay, so let's look at the stationary uh, di distribution in this equilibrium. So here, here is the um, this is the, uh, the this is the holdings distributions for the rich and the poor consumers. Those type uh, the, those A sub tau distributions, and this is the A sub tau um, uh, of the empty set, the share in the outside good for each of the each of the consumers. Uh, so there's going to be one for each type of consumer. And then you see here what is going on in this market is the rich consumers are buying a lot of new cars with the poor consumers, they're buying the older cars. And what's going on is these guys are buying them and then as they age, they sell them off to some of the poor consumers. Okay. Now, if there's high transaction costs, what is happening here is that this is pushing some of the consumers in the outside goods. Some of the poor consumers, more poor consumers are pu 
put into the outside good and not really find it worth it to, to, to own cars because uh, there's a lot of rich people buying buying new cars, but uh, not as many as before, okay? And it's too costly for them to sell them to the poor consumers. So really now there's fewer people, poor people that are owning cars simply just because of the transaction cost. And this is, you know, reflected by the number of buyers over here that's directly comparable with what you see over there. Um, okay, so let's um, let's let's move on. Um, so so just to conclude here um, from this simple example, you see there's gains from trade and 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 you see there's equilibrium sorting. Okay, so you see uh, basically the gains from trade is you get the lower prices in this economy over here. This is lower than this one. The 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 the, the, the um, and then you see also the sorting of uh, richer uh, consumers uh, into the newer cards and that they're selling to the uh, to the um, um, poor consumers and the fraction of poor consumers who do not own a car is much higher when you increase the transactions cost. You get the specialization in holdings or, or sorting that enables the gains from trade. Uh, cars remained much uh, remains longer in the market um, um, when there's trade and then our market clears in aggregate but not in, in, in type by type just like uh, uh, implied by, by this, this car here, right? So um, because it's uh, you know the mar uh, it's um, because of this selling from from high con type consumers to low type consumers, then you don't have the the trading matrix uh, with uh, in, that the holdings distribution the type specific holdings distribution is a fixed point on this trading matrix. Okay, um, and then high transaction costs suppress trade and lower the scrap age. Okay, like like you see here in this graph, you see that essentially the scrap age is is now uh, lower because uh, this it's the, because this gain of trade eliminate the possibility that the poor guys can own these cars okay so that's kind of the conclusion for from from this simple example and I think you know we, we already learned some uh, some of the dynamics in the in durable good markets from this now we also have a multiple type uh, make model of cars and 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 so here we can allow for J types and make some models of cars. So now cars are different, not only consumers. And then the a car is characterized by a pair of what type it is and what age it is. It it's pretty much the same thing. Okay, and we can we stay, 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 can still maintain the infinite elasticity assumption. So prices of those all those cars are going to be fixed of the new cars. Uh, something we can uh, you know relax on later. And then uh, there's one common. Um, um, uh, scrap price. We just assume that's the same. This that's really like a easy thing uh, to change. Okay. Um, and then uh, there's a little slide of notation change of notation here, where J denotes the choice of the outside good having no car, and J equal to zero denotes the decision of keep the current car. So, but I'm not going to go into details here. I think I'm going to uh, essentially uh, just outline what I have in mind in pictures, and we we. Um, uh, we have a, a, a basically uh, a, with the type choice model, a kind of a nested choice model uh, in in the spirit of the nested logic model. So we adopt that specification, and we get something that looks very much uh, like this, or that looks like this tree here. Okay, so and we get choice probabilities like well, they have to be recursively calculated like you would do in a nested logit, but otherwise they're all closed forms for choice probabilities and expected value functions. So very neat. Everything holds with differentiability. Uh, uh, and, and, and smoothness in, in the price vector, everything is is, is, is is very similar to before. Okay, so it's really just an application of what we've just seen. But but I want to dwell a little bit here with the nest logic specification. So what you choose is either the outside good or you keep uh, choose to keep the car that you have. Um, okay, so uh, this is what we used to call Kappa. Or you choose uh, some uh, to buy a car of some type, okay? So this is like type uh, J, okay? This is like keep keep the one you have. And then if you choose to, to buy a, 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 a car of uh, any type, you have to choose whatever t car type you buy. And whenever you choose that, then you choose which one of the uh, cars at the market that you, you or, or with different ages of, of cars, type one in this case that you will buy or type J, okay? And that's gonna be cable J of all these cars. And with all this, you will get, uh, again, uh, nested load choice probabilities and, 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 and log sums that can be calculated uh, you know, in, in, in closed forms. Okay.
Uh, again, the Bellman equation is just a little has a little bit more indices, but the idea is essentially very much the same. So I'm going to skip very fast through this um, because you know the you, you I will just refer you to the paper and see the equations there. Okay, um, and 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 so I'm going to skip all this here. Okay, the the bottom line here is is that that's really just uh, an application of the existing theory theory with some slide modifications. Okay, there will be for instance there will be J flow equilibrium conditions. There will be one for each of the type of cars that would have to be the same. Um, you know, all, all new cars introduced uh, uh, of each of the types would be have to be replaced, but that's really just a, a matter of, you know, treating dimensions. And then you solve that uh, uh, in the same way as you solve for... Uh, um, and then you, the, you will have to solve for, for the market shares of these... Uh, uh, makes on models in 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 equilibrium with the aggregate market shares, uh, which is kind of the the flip side of how many people is not owning cars. That's like the you know the mark is similar to the market share where you uh, in the in the one type car economy, right? Uh, you know the fraction of car people who own cars. So of course, when you have more cars, there's many different uh, ways you can own cars, and that's going to be j j j of them. We can handle that too. Okay. So here's an example. So here's a multiple car and consumer type example. Two types. It's like a two type two model with two types of consumers, two types of cars. So J is equal to two. We got basically the same consumer types. The previous example, poor and rich, and now uh, the same. The normal car is the same as before, but now we have a luxury car with the price is somewhat higher, thirty percent higher, and a little bit higher scrap value. Okay. Um, uh, it's more desirable for all the consumers to own that car. So basically, the utility of that car is 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 higher uh, for all, uh, and and it's depreciating uh, uh, slower in value. Okay, so this is like you know the the dur very durable luxury Volvo. Okay, um, and and this is com you know compared to the to the other normal car that has this utility. Okay. And so both have the same transaction cost and accident probabilities. So it's going to be the model predicts it's going to be a strong strong sorting of, of consumer types into ages into types of cars just like before. So it's like now we get just open up and make some of the, these cars different to give them different properties, and that gives different types of sorting, just like we saw in the initial in in the beginning how this the heavy and light vehicles and and uh, where where some of the medium uh, uh, quintile consumers would actually buy new new uh, smaller vehicles because of uh, yeah they could sell them to some of their even poorer. Okay, so here you got two sets of equilibrium prices, uh, and and one is newer to begin with. So you, you see the the price of the used car market is going to also going to be higher. Okay, and it's also more durable, kept longer in the market, uh, like like you would expect from the utility uh, uh, derived from that that car. Um, here is the equilibrium with two consumers and two two car types, and you got um, here you got a car type uh, number. Uh, number one and uh, and number two. This is the luxury car, and you see much fewer poor consumers in the luxury car. They are buying mostly from this this uh, um, this, this this normal car, and and they're still buying from the rich. Um, and but still, there's some consumers are uh, in even for the luxury car that buy some of the older vintages of of that car. Okay, so so uh, here you got you know this lot this this gains from trade from having different types of consumers that play together with the different types and ages of cars and consumers that are really trading with each other in this economy. No, so these were like simple examples, right? So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a, a simple back of the envelope simulation of the Danish economy. Uh, it's it, it, it reform that half the registration taxes and and make uh, and and consider road user charges. Okay, instead. Okay, so the what we do to implement this counterfactual simulation is we first we calibrate the model to the data and then we cut the registration in half and uh, registration tax in half um, for new vehicles and then um, increase. Uh, um, the fuel tax uh, so that the tax revenue is supposed to be ex uh, unchanged. And then we compute the economic welfare and economic implications uh, of this counterfactual. But before we do that, we need to put usage into the car, okay, or driving into the car. And, and we're going to assume that the probability of an accident is really um, um, not affected by how much you drive the car or the aging 
or of the car. And in, in other words, the value of the car is not depreciated but driving it. Okay. So, so, so that makes driving, you know, exogenous to the placement decision and, 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 um, or it makes it it's static, and we can solve for that as a as simple static sub problem, just like we did with the uh, with the housing problem uh, or the residential location choice problem last last period. We choose the number of square meters optimally. Okay, of course, this is an approximation, but. But it's it's giving us again. It's giving us a whole log. Here, I think actually it's not really a bad assumption. Not like when I sit down and decide how much to drive, that I'm thinking about the dynamic consequences of depreciation of my car. I mean, it's it, it's there, but it's, it's it's probably second order to re relative to the uh, dynamics of the purchase decision, where there's all these transactions cost, and you think about how to trade with others and so on. At least this is not something we are investigating further. Okay, so we can view uh, this. Uh, um, uh, as the demand for driving, which is the you know the uh, argument, the maximize the utility of driving nest, net off the cost of driving, um, um, and where here you got the market, same market utility of the, on the cost of driving, and then we can substitute that right back in to the utility function and derive an indirect utility that accounts for optimal driving, and and so uh, uh, yeah, so this is really. Uh, so we uh, assume this formal specification for preferences with this quadratic utility function that it gives us um, uh, that gives us a closed form uh, driving equation, and and then we allow this parameter here to be um, basically uh, 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 the, the the demand for driving. You could potentially allow that to be you know correlated with the age of the car, or you can have type specific coefficients and. And you can have, uh, you know, maybe you know older cars are driven less, and uh, and then you can have like a, 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 a consumer type specific coefficient and co consumer type uh, or car type specific coefficients too. That's that's what we have, and then we can uh, we can estimate this as a simple linear regression. Okay, and and then then we have done that, and uh, using the data uh, in in uh, uh, Gillingham and Munk Nielsen, um, and and then we get these uh, uh, coefficients essentially. Uh, uh, there is uh, the consumer fixed effect. Uh, there's a consumer fixed effect, and there's a car fixed effect. So the car type two, which is the luxury car that's uh, driven more, and then uh, there is a fuel price. Uh, the fuel price or price per kilometer varies by by car type. So one is more uh, fuel efficient than than the other. Okay, um, and and so. Uh, then we, given this calibration, uh, given this this estimation, we calibrate the remaining parameters, and I'm going to leave that for you to look at in the appendix. But there's a bunch of moments that we're trying to match by by um, by uh, calibrating the rain uh, or varying the re remaining uh, parameters in the model. So this would be like the fraction of cars uh, by different consumers shares, the fraction of new cars owned by consumers different types, a fraction of older cars, and and so on. So there's there's some 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 we take out some moments and then that are informative about the structural parameters and then we vary the parameters until this uh, uh, moments they are predicted by the model is is uh, is the same as those found in the data. Okay, so uh, not so much time to talk about the structural estimation, but let's let's do the counterfactual simulation. This is what we started out with, right? This is the uh, what we wanted to use the model for, the analyzing the uh, um, uh, reform that that changes the registration taxes and introduces road juicer charging, or uh, as we do here, uh, introduce uh, 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 change taxation of gasoline. To change the usage of the car. Now, now, what do we have here? We got like seventy. Uh, uh, the half the, the counterfactual we're considering is halving the registration tax. So this is because the car, the, there's some deductions at the bottom. This means that the new normal car will drop uh, in price with twenty five percent and twenty seven percent for the new luxury car. Okay, that, so they're not that different. Okay, so none of them are, are the Volvo XC ninety uh, to one point four million kroner. Um, because there, it would the drop would have been even bigger. Okay, so we only have these two cars here in this it's, it's, uh, you know calibrated example. Then in the baseline, um, then we calibrate the model on the on the Danish economy in in, in a, a tax system in two thousand and eight, 
Um, and, and this is the first thing we do. So we, we here, we, this is how we set all the structural parameters. And then from that, we can just simulate all the different outcomes. Okay, and, uh, and we, for instance here, we can simulate what the, what the total tax revenue and, and fuel tax revenue and car tax revenue are. Um, and, and we're gonna do that in the baseline. Then we consider another, uh, another case here with the non-equilibrium simulation. Okay, so this is this is what this is what you often end up doing when you do this sorts of policy analysis where you don't have an equilibrium model. When they say, okay, if we reduce prices by uh, fifty percent of the new uh, new pri price, then our, a good guess of how that affects the um, uh, how that affects the the used car prices is that they're going to fall by the same proportion. So we can uh, m make that assumption here and and calculate a counterfactual where we just change the prices and do not recompute the equilibrium. But you just use those, uh, you know, um, a little bit ad hoc prices, uh, but but uh, proportional prices corresponding to 100% path through um, that people actually use for policy analysis. Okay, so that corresponds um, to to dropping all used car prices by 25%, 0.6% for the normal car, 0.27.1% uh, for the luxury car. Okay. So, um, so they just draw, draw proportional. The, the the scrap is unchanged. Uh, it's just the prices we move, and then we recalculate demand. Now, in this case, the equilibrium is actually not in, uh, in equilibrium. Okay, so the the uh, the, the we just cal recalculate the choice probabilities and and uh, and uh, and and go from there. Okay, so but but not equilibrium choice probabilities. If fuel taxes uh, here uh, uh, increase actually to keep. Uh, then we increase the fuel taxes to keep the uh, total tax revenue constant. Okay, so this is what we are trying to do in this baseline here. This is non-EQ. Okay, so we 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 take the the baseline and then we uh, reduce the prices of new cars and also of the used cars by the same proportion. Okay, so this goes for all the different th uh, for uh, diff uh, the 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 the, uh, the different counterfactuals that we are doing. Okay, now here. We, what we do in this non-equilibrium here is that we're using this proportional drop in the prices, but then we are looking at the tax revenue. Uh, uh, we are changing the fuel tax in so that the total tax revenue is the same. Okay, now note the there's a drop in the tax revenue for the car tax and recreation tax because we've halved it, um, but then there's also an increase in, uh, then we have to increase the fuel tax revenue, okay? Now, one of the things that you'll see here is um, if you take those prices and that policy here and ca calculate the equilibrium based on that new situation, then you're going to not get actually uh, the same total tax revenue. And this is what we're doing here in the second counterfactual. We're doing an equilibrium calculation, but we are using the new um, um, fuel the new fuel tax, which was uh, should, supposed to be 73% rather than 50% as in the baseline. Um, so we're using that uh, and investigating, okay, so in equilibrium, what is the effect of that policy? Okay, do we actually balance the tax revenue? Is it still revenue neutral as we've calculated if we ignore the equilibrium effect or if we approximated the equilibrium effect by 100% path through? And, and so here, look at this, right? This is the total tax revenue. If you go, if you use that kind of wrong policy that is supposed to balance uh, the tax revenue and is if you're holding fixed those prices, well, it almost cut it in half. So this is like, you know, an example that you would, you would be careful to do policy analysis without any equilibrium calculation. Right? Because if you suddenly use half of your, you know, 50 billion Danish kroner, then you, you know, you, you kind of, you know, you have a situation, right? So then you're going to do the last example here, which is what we call EQ neutral, where we calculate the equilibrium um, uh, and and uh, while making the policy, okay, so we are calculating a revenue neutral reform uh, with based on a simulation where we cut the registration in tax in half and then increase uh, uh, fuel prices. Now it turns out that the fuel prices increase uh, uh, only to seventy percent to keep the revenue neutral. Um, and, and and this sounds super counterintuitive that it actually drops, but this is because. 
um, this 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 uh, this wrong uh, policy that we ended up with is actually fuel prices that make us above the top of the Laffer curve, which means that you need to reduce the the tax in order to get more tax revenue. So um, so so here this is the uh, this is the equilibrium with the you know with the 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 the, the revenue neutral policy, and here you get the same tax revenue as you can get. You have equilibrium prices, and you have a higher actually a higher fuel tax revenue with a lower uh, fuel tax. Um, and also because uh, now because it makes it takes into account it's not only when you're taxing fuel, it's not only taking into it's not only um, uh, the driving you're affecting, but also the the number of people who are buying cars that you are affecting. So if more people are, are, are owning cars and driving them at this lower uh, price uh, of fuel, then you get more eventually more t tax revenue. Okay, so here are the prices. Okay, so this is maybe I should have shown that first. But here's here's the baseline, right? These are the equilibrium prices in the baseline. Okay, and then we have this non-EQ, which is the red one, corresponding to just a like a proportional uh, drop in the prices, corresponding to how much the the tax change would drop the uh, new car price. Okay, so this this just drops proportionally all the way down th uh, here. Uh, this is this is our non-equilibrium. Uh, um, simulation. Okay. Now, then we do do the uh, calculate the equilibrium and try to figure out what is the um, change in in prices, and it turns out that the prices of the older cars they actually drop more than proportionally. So it's not only uh, you know they they, they 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 drop more than proportionally, and the scrap age also change. Okay. So uh, and and if you calculate. Uh, um, if you calculate base policy and ignore that this also affects the value of the used car market, okay, and ignore that effect, well, you also uh, ignore uh, incentives um, um, for for new pe people uh, to to buy cars because they are supposed to sell those car new cars to those that are. Um, Th those that are, are are down here in this distribution, but now the price is lower. So there's not only a price of cutting the tax, but there's also the price that the resale value is is actually less than proportionally falling. Okay, so this is this is actually this is evidently important. Okay, so here's some more outcomes, and and and, and here I've repeated the car tax revenue and kind of break down what what it depends on. So so you see here in the baseline. These are the these are the numbers of the probabilities of, of uh, buying new cars of, of different types for rich and poor um, uh, for for the rich and poor, and you see that they immediately you know increase quite a lot um, when you do the non equilibrium. That is this curve here, right? Okay, so but if you once you take into account that there's uh, the, the equilibrium, well, then that new car purchase is going to fall, right? Because they realize that. Uh, that the used car prices is going to be even lower than pr uh, proportional falls. So those prices used here were really non-equilibrium prices and wrong. Okay, and 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 so uh, this equilibrium here um, uh, at at this. Uh, uh, Policy that was supposed to uh, be make revenue neutral result in this outcome here. Now we we we, we uh, redesign the policy to make the uh, um, uh, the policy uh, um, um, uh, revenue neutral here, and then you would have to uh, uh, change. And then prices would change, and then the policy would also change. You have to actually have this lower transaction cost. Note, note here actually this this uh, uh, actually an increased share of people in the outside good after this reform, um, which is uh, you know surprising given that we're having the price of the used car. But you're still price. You're still making cars more expensive, right? Because we're just taxing them in a, a more inefficient way. Now we're taxing what people. Uh, or we are taxing them in a way where that gives rise to lower consumer surplus, um, and and people just value driving in their cars, and and when they, they take that into account, they actually purchase cars. Okay, so so here's this is kind of summing up a lot of stuff that I already said. I think uh, one one thing key thing to say here is that this drastic gap in the tax revenue for the same policy that we made on the non-equilibrium. Uh, really underscores the importance of modeling secondary markets. Okay, so otherwise you can get you know utterly wrong. Okay.
One of the things that we notice here is that, that at the high fuel price uh, from the non-equilibrium simulation and the, uh, that, that was also, a, where we also calculate the equilibrium consequences of that uh, higher fuel price, actually makes it about the top of the point of the Laffer curve, okay? So lowering actually the fuel, pr fuel, fuel tax, giving uh, a pump, pump price of 17.8 kroner, uh, in the EQ neutral uh, experiment actually really um, uh, has a big effect because it it decreasing the tax decreasing the tax or decreasing the price make people uh, make the revenue actually increase and you can see this here so we've drawn the Laffer curve in 3D uh, so here you got the the car tax relative to the baseline so it's like registration tax so you got the same as in the baseline here and then no tax and then you got uh, the fuel price uh, uh, relative to the baseline, so so baseline that's that's a hundred percent, okay. And you can you can see as basically you are increasing both of the taxes as well. The the top of the lever curve uh, moves. If you look at the car tax for here for for uh, break it down, this is the same data. Break it down by different fuel taxes. So here you have a low fuel tax, and then you have a a a, a, a little bit higher fuel tax, and then you have like a uh, uh, you know, the 100%, this is the fuel tax uh, that we have in the baseline, right? As you change the fuel tax, as you increase the, the the top of the Laffer curve moves to the left. So that kind of puts limit of how much tax uh, you can um, have a relative to the baseline. So these two th uh, taxes are obviously interconnected because we have two different ways of taxing the same good. But in the end, if you tax fuel, you're making cars the discounted value of a car just more expensive, right? So you need to take these two things into account and, and, and this three-dimensional Laffer curve show how these taxes are really, really, really connected. Okay, so here's the, um, uh, some of the effects on the driving fuel emissions and taxes. Uh, in the baseline, we dri the driving is 15,000 kilometers. It's lower in the, in the equilibrium uh, neutral, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the counterfactual, where we do the right thing of calculating the equilibrium while doing the policy. Um, so people end up driving less. There's less fuel consumption, less CO2 emission. Uh, there's also less if, uh, revenue from that and, and also less revenue from, um, and, and then also less consumer surplus because even though people actually get to buy the cars much cheaper, they, have, they, get, they get hammered by the fuel tax, okay? Um, then there is the, the uh, if you, if we also calculate externalities based on, uh, on you know, the world market price for CO2. Uh, and so we multiply that with, with the CO2 and then the number of kilometers, there's some numbers for, for uh, you know, val values assessed of, of congestion price. Uh, 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 con congestion externalities. Also, all this is in here. So, if really, if you're combining um, what you see here, is that there's a huge reduction in consumer welfare from this reform, um, even though it's supposed to be better. And the welfare, welfare externalities that's weighted up, you know, that's that's um, that's dropping, uh, is only really dropping by three thousand. So here, it's really not a suge good suggestion to. To, to do that. And the, you look at the size of the these drops in consumer surplus at the car market and hold it up against what the price of the CO2 is. Well, uh, you have to put a different weight on CO2 for this to be a good decision. So so the transportation sector, it's really expensive to, to uh, you know, uh, get some CO2 reductions. Okay, that's kind of the bottom line here. So um, yeah, so here's here's a, I pretty much said most of this, so I'm gonna skip it, uh, and then move on to the Petron price equilibrium. Okay, the endogenous determinant of new car prices. I'm gonna skip most of the details here and just move on to the results. So basically, I've, I, I think I've said it several times that we now add you know, two con car producers um, that that can produce the, either these two goods. Okay, so there's now two firms, uh, firm one and firm two, or there could be several firms. And then they could beat in this oligopolistic market uh, of, of Petron price competition. Okay, so we've got Petron price competition, and these two uh, firms they are setting prices of all their products in this uh, market. In 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 and basically the prices here are the equilibrium uh, prices that are um, that are uh, the solutions to both firms. Uh, 
um, best uh, best responses. Okay, so where 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 you find best responses to prices charged by by the competitors, and then in equilibrium you have uh, the, the situation where the uh, where, where where the prices that they are in equilibrium are mutually best responses for 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 all the firms. Okay, so um, and 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 then here's some more details. I'm gonna skip. I'm gonna skip. Okay, this was just the parameterization. Okay, so here here it's just an illustration of how the primary market demand uh, curve changes. For this is a. Uh, uh, basically, the the demand or the market share for uh, for new cars as a function of the uh, uh, of of, the, of its price. Okay, so there's demand for for type one car and demand for type two car. So when you change the price of type one car, then it's going to increase the the demand for type two cars. Okay, so so you can derive that from from this model here. Then there's a market share of the outside good. So when when the price of the uh, type one increase, then more people go into the outside good. Because you know so now one of the goods is suddenly more expensive, and and one of the um, um, and and there's only really the other firm back in the market that now has has you know can set the prices much higher. Okay, but but this is not an equilibrium. In equilibrium, there will be uh, you know two firms in, with mutual best responses. I'm going to show that in a second. So here, kind of the scrap it age by type one car, and and here we have like a, a this discrete uh, scrap it age, but but. Um, that that will be smoothed out if you have a, like a smooth rapid choice. Um, then, uh, as the price of the Type One car increase, well, then the uh, they're going to be kept longer uh, in the economy. Those that that are actually bought. Okay. Then here you got the Bertrand price equilib uh, Bertrand uh, Nash equilibrium, where the uh, with the best response functions for the two firms. So you got Firm One's best response function is a fun. Uh, uh, and then you got firm 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 uh, firm two's best response and firm one's best response. Okay, so you got the price of a type two car here, and then you see uh, uh, at, at that um, the the best response uh, of, uh, of 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 firm one is uh, you know to 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 increase the, uh, the 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 price of that car. Okay, uh, um, um, yeah. Anyway, so uh, so here's here's an equilibrium, um, and this is a Bertrand Nash equilibrium where uh, the, where these two best response functions are, are crossing each other. Okay, so um, I think I'm gonna conclude with these results. So we consider this uh, merged to mon monopoly um, um, situation. So we start with a duopoly that I've just described, where you got the you know here's here's the 151. That's a price, no, 186. So we're looking at, at car type 2, 86. Um, this is for, for uh, this is the price of uh, car uh, type 2 is 86. And then you got the price of car 1, that's uh, 154, uh, 51 apparently. Yeah, yeah, so a little bit lower, yes. Uh, this is this is the uh, price of the duopoly price, okay? And then you, uh, in in the, uh, we also calculate the social optimal where you price uh, cars according to the marginal cost that we specified in the stuff that jumped over. Okay, so so here, it's, the duopoly is actually pretty efficient in this calibration or in this parameterization. But then if you, you uh, uh, do the monopoly and allow the two uh, firms to merge, then what will happen is they will end up essentially producing uh, only car two and and really uh, uh, um, and really increasing the, the 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 price of of both cars and then the fraction of consumers that buys cars really like drops for both of them there's a few people who buy a uh, type one car uh, and 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 uh, and see the market sh uh, the number of consumers uh, uh, the the buys a type two car is also dropping significantly. But if you look here at um, at at the profits, well, the profits are, uh, are higher. Um, so the, the the firm is making monopoly profits by increasing its pricing the prices when there's no competition here. So this is not really good for the car market. And then there is a fraction of people with no car. Um, is, is just increasing a lot. Okay, so um, you see consumer surplus for this is for rich consumers and, and poor consumers from, from in both cases they just drop uh, uh, quite a lot. Okay, so the total consumer surplus by um, by car owners are, you know it drops and and then uh, the consumer surplus for the people in the outside good um, well it doesn't drop. Um, 
the profits increase, but the overall total surplus is really like more than halved. And and so merging these two firms and allowing them to to produce uh, these two goods themselves and figure out how to sell the prices, set the prices, really, really has a devastating effect on the uh, on the market economy. Okay, and 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 uh, you also see now that that consumers they are holding those cars. Uh, uh, much longer, and these these uh, firms, then they are taking into account the consumers. They are uh, they are making these dynamic decisions, and and so in that sense, when you when you uh, when you change the price, you in in some sense in competition with your own good, right? Um, and and so they also take that into account. Okay, so I have a whole bunch of slides about how to do macroeconomic shocks. It can be done. It's pretty hard, um, but you get if you do that too, you get waves in the distribution. And here it's an example, uh, and you got you know uh, you can surf on the waves. So here's 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 John Rust just surfing on the waves. So I don't have time to cover that, but but it's in the slide deck.